All right, so we're going to call the, meeting, the Washington Central Unified School District for a meeting of September 18th uh, to order at 6, uh, 16. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for being here with us uh, as we gather here this evening. I, I want to begin by reminding us that we're in this together. Uh, I often say this to our community members that reach out to me, and I often say this to our board, uh, because it's important to remember that we share the same goals and concerns. We do, but we understand the heartache and the difficulty that come with discussions about school closure. But this isn't about closing schools, it's about growing schools, growing learning environments, and creating more opportunities for our, all our kids and communities. We are all connected by a thread. Pulling one thread too hard could unravel everything. But weaving together our efforts, we can create something far stronger. So tonight, let's reflect on our shared vision. What is our desired future for our schools and our students? How can we leverage our core beliefs, our strategic plan, and strengthen our programs and ensure the success for all? Uh, this present, process won't yield immediate results and we've been having those discussions around but it is a strategic investment in our future by building on each other's strengths we will ensure that our children have opportunities for deeper learning and personal growth we must also acknowledge that public education is facing significant challenges in our state it, but this effort isn't just about closing school it's about being strategic in how we strengthen and sustain our broader communities not just as individual towns, but as united, as a whole. Let's try to keep this perspective in mind as we move forward in tonight's discussion. We're stronger when we weave our efforts together, and together we can create a future that benefits all of our children and our communities. So with that in mind, I wanted to see if there were any adjustments to the agenda. Seeing none, I want to to welcome our guests and open it to public comment. We're just gonna have a minute and a half and 15 minutes uh, at the beginning of the meeting because we have also placed some public comment uh, time right after the presentation. So if you have a public comment that it is uh, related to something that is not in the agenda, please go ahead and raise your hand right now. If you have a public comment that is related to data presentation and then and then we can hand those over to the board before the next public comment is that okay it's up to you it's up to you I'm just saying that you have all these options right now we were we were hoping to have public comment at the beginning if there's issues that are not related to the board and keep that open to, to all, and if you have comments that are directly in reference to the data presented, please go ahead and present them after the data in case the presentation informs any of your thinking. And so with that, I see one hand up, in, and I see one in the public and one online. I'm gonna go move with the one in the public, just because it might be easier, please say your name and uh, go ahead and one second we're gonna start the timer so thank you my name is Anya Skibby I'm just gonna wait until you have a copy if you want to oh, okay so let me pause the timer because I started it so <coughs> Thank you. 
Okay, I'm gonna assume, go ahead. Perfect, thank you. We are members of this community who care about kids, the future of Dodie, and all of our schools. We thank you, the board, for your time and effort looking for ways to make education better for our kids and to keep costs under control. We also thank the board for valuing community input. We ask that this letter be made part of the official record of this September 18th board meeting. It has been signed by 286 people total, including 207 adults and five youth from Worcester, 68 residents from other towns in our district, and six people from outside of our district. We have emailed a copy to the board with links to our sources and handed you one the paper. We have two very important requests. The first is please do not move forward with plans to close Doty Memorial School by sending this question to Worcester voters in November. While board members may argue that there is no harm in letting our town vote, in fact, this will likely increase scapegoating of Worcester and the belief that our school is the primary cause of unwanted taxes, regardless of actual tax impacts. The second is to make a formal commitment to honor and to not attempt to override any of our district's town's votes regarding the closure of its own school, either by attempting to change the current articles of agreement through calling for a district-wide vote or by appealing to the state to override the town's vote. While not legally binding, a formal commitment would go a long way towards reestablishing trust between the board and our community and bring greater legitimacy to this process. Hi, my name is Rosemary Leach from Worcester. We do not believe closing Doty is the right thing to do. Here's why. Student well-being and learning. Studies of school closures find that students often experience a loss of sense of connectedness and belonging with peers and community and face increased mental health challenges. Overall, these students have a lower test scores and worse attendance and behavior in the short term. In the long term, they're less likely than their peers to complete college and have a job and their earnings tend to be lower. Family and community engagement. Studies show that family and community engagement declines when a school closes and students are moved to school outside the local community. Caregiver and community engagement are key to a child's sense of connectedness, resilience, and academic performance. A wealth of research reinforces the importance of connectedness for kids' mental health and wellness. Equity. Worcester is the town in our district with the highest number of children eligible for free and reduced lunch on the one hand, and with the lowest median family income on the other. In proposing to close Doty, the board would join school boards across the country that close schools in their poorest communities. While declines in learning are common for students over the years following their school's closure, research finds that students experiencing poverty, students of color, and those with special needs tend to be most negatively impacted. Based on much data tracking, what happens after a local school is closed, we are likely to see increased levels of poverty among the Worcester students' population, leading to even greater disparities between the kids who ride the bus from Worcester compared to their middle sex peers. Small cost savings. Based on the numbers provided by the board as of September 5th, the cost savings to the district and closing ability will be approximately 2 to 3% of the FY25 district budget. Increasing costs for busing and the expanded enrichment opportunities the board is promising could mean even less money saved. National data finds that per people spending tends to increase post-consolidation, while anticipated cost efficiencies from economies of scale rarely materialize or save much less or save much less money than expected. With the lowest per pupil spending of the five elementary schools before the merger, Doty demonstrated that it can effectively provide a quality education as illustrated by the data we are able to access for fiscal years 26. 2016 and 2017, which are representative of the years before the district consolidation in 2019. Big financial impacts on Worcester. Based on FY25 tax rates and the budgetary information made available to the board by the board as of September 5th, it has been estimated that closing Doty would save Worcester residents approximately $33 in school taxes annually for $100,000 cost value, not accounting for income sensitivity. Based on those same numbers, if the town of Worcester were to take on the cost of maintaining the Doty building, including capital expenses, it has been estimated that the additional tax burden per Worcester household would be approximately $911 annually, with no income sensitivity available. Other economic, economic <coughs> impacts of school closings documented in the research include significant losses in property values, property tax revenues, public investment and population, as well as funded economic activity. This could mean significant tax increases for nearly every Worcester resident. 
down the bottom now. Uh, regarding enrollment, Doty has had a relatively stable student population for many years with a well-established system of multi-age education that creates staffing efficiencies and socio social and emotional benefits for students. From fiscal year 22 to FY27, the student population at Doty is projected to fluctuate by approximately 6% or 5 students. By contrast, the student population at East Montpelier is projected to decline by 29% or 70 students, and the student population at Romney is projected to decline by 22% or 31 students. <coughs> Regarding the timeline and community engagement process, the board asked the community for other configuration ideas. The community responded, offering many alternative ideas. None of those ideas has been modeled or seriously considered by the board yet. The board and the public have not had an opportunity to review budget calculations for FY26 or to ask questions about the proposed budget and possible alternatives prior to today. There are also important outstanding questions about how class configuration would work in a combined Doty Lundy school especially considering mathematical inconsistencies in the models presented by the administration. Doty is located at the heart of our community. Our community wants to keep it there. Thank you for hearing our voices. Noah Weinstein, Worcester. I'd like to provide some context for our request that the board commit to honoring and not attempting to override the town vote regarding the closure of its own school. When our five towns merged into one supervisory district in 2019, three of the schools, East Montpelier, Middlesex, and Berlin, carried debt, and two did not, Worcester and Callis. That debt continues to cost the district approximately $1 million annually. As part of a compromise for creating the district's Articles of Agreement, it was decided that all towns would carry all of the debt, as was legally required, and that if the school board ever proposed to close a town school, that town would have final say. However, in the same Articles of Agreement, it also states that the school board could propose to change that clause by putting the issue to a district-wide vote. At a recent board meeting in which this issue was discussed, our board's chair response was that the board is already bound by the Articles of Agreement and no one has been discussing overriding a town's vote, so why should they commit to something they are already bound by? However, one district resident has already asked the board to put the issue to five-town vote. I have had a private conversation with one board member who made extended arguments in support of a five-town vote. Our board chair, acting in a different role, has advocated for the state legislature to create a law to bypass a town's closure vote and put the final decision to the governor. The rationale for such a process was that vigorous local opposition to school board plans stymies progress. This request is not coming from out of the blue. If the board is considering putting the question of school closures to a vote in Worcester and Callis in November, we also believe it is important for the board to bring greater trust and legitimacy to the process by honoring a town's vote regarding the closure of its own school. Thank you. Thank okay, you. We're going to move to, um, oh, go ahead, Tim. Sorry, I did see. Yeah. Hi, my name is Johnny Waterhouse. I'm from Worcester. And I want to talk tonight about legacy. Closing schools is a public policy choice that shapes communities for generations. With such important decisions before us, it's essential to think really clearly about the kind of communities we want to live in and the inheritance we want to leave for all of our grandchildren. I don't believe any of you want to leave a legacy of hollowed out communities gutted of institutions that help keep them and their, their residents well. Um, increased income disparities between the towns that have schools and those that don't, less connectedness for kids and families, or young kids from the poorest communities on the longest bus rides. In a changing world, we adapt. There's a lot we can learn from how Doty adapted to the changes that are now impacting our neighboring towns. Folks, this is a legacy moment. The choices you make will either point us toward a future we can all lean into together or will make that future unlikely or impossible. As you consider these choices, I ask you to really stay firmly grounded in the legacy you want to leave for all of our grandchildren. Let's work together to figure out how to get there. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Are there any more hands? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Hi, my name is Lauren Chabot and I am a Worcester resident. 
I would like to ask the board tonight, in the reconfiguration process, are you working towards equity for all, equity for most, or simply equality? The district equity policy approved in June of 2023 states, educational equity occurs when each child receives what they need to develop to their full academic and social emotional potential. It goes on to say, equity goes beyond formal equality where all students are treated the same. In reading the FAQ configuration document published by the school board, the answer to the question regarding whether it's equitable to close the two smallest schools, this is the answer. The concept of equity is subjective. Our goal is to pursue, encourage, and define equity in a way that benefits the most students, educationally and socially. I'd like to focus on the word most. And again ask, are you seeking equity for each child as the policy states, or for most as stated in your FAQ document? To me, in a recent example, what benefiting the most looks like is some communities having multiple bus routes and shorter bus rides, and others, in this case, Worcester students having one bus route, resulting in significantly longer bus rides than their peers in the district, as shown in the slides in the September 4th presentation. That is equity for most, and it does not give those students who are not in the most group what they need to be successful. I'm concerned that the reconfiguration equity for most mentality will have a detrimental impact on those who don't fall into the most group. Equity for most is not good enough. For a district that includes the core beliefs of humanity and justice, we should be striving as the district policy states in equity for each child, not simply for most. Thank you. I'm going to move to people online. Uh, Rachel, you had your hand up. Good evening. I have a letter I shared with my community yesterday, which has so far been signed by myself and 55 others that I will submit to the board and ask to have included in the record. Uh, the letter echoes the Worcester speaker's concerns and requests. In addition, it presents data that I found on the AOE dashboard because I wanted to understand whether there, the experience of other communities with large elementary schools showed students having better proficiency. I looked at Calis data. The most recently available data was from 2016 and 17 because our district is no longer reporting school level data. And what I found was that across English, language arts and math, um, that in those two years, our students exceeded the state average for proficiency or above um, on 62.5% of the assessments that I could see data on. I found eight large schools that exceeded that had similar levels of poverty and similar numbers of students on IEPs. And across those eight schools, I found that they exceeded the state average for proficient or above only 54% of their assessments. And then I looked at small schools with similar size populations to what Calis has now. There are only a few of these that also have similar sizes, similar rates of poverty and uh, disability in their schools. And I saw some really impressive results. In Cornwall, 92% of third graders were proficient or above in math and ELA. At Faceton, the students exceeded all the questions. You're welcome to submit your comments on writing, too. We have a really, really long meeting tonight. There's going to be also more public comment. After I have the just three questions that I'd love to ask. What is the current data for Callis and Doty on proficiencies? How do the elementary schools compare to other schools of the same size? How would they be comparable if we closed these two schools? And if these closures are really about giving our students better opportunities, what would have to be done to prevent declines in our overall rates of proficiency for our students when they are moved to be more anonymous in bigger pools? Thank you. La Laura? Oh, Laura Lee. Laura Lee, sorry. Hi, um, I, can you hear me okay? We can hear yes. you. Okay, great. Oh, wait, I can turn my camera on too. You'd think technology. Okay. Oh, it appears to be working on my end, maybe not yours. Um, so I am here on a bit of a different note. I, I plan to speak later, but every day when I travel to school, I wonder what the day will bring. I'm a classroom teacher in Calis. And so I want to express my concern 
about the lack of district support for CALIS right now. I wonder how many folks here are aware that there are five paraprofessional positions being advertised at the district level, and three of those are, are unfilled in our school, in CALIS. We have three short staff people in our school out of five district wide. Recently, while student testing was trying to occur, there was an enormous computer glitch that needed updating district wide. Callis was the last school to be visited for this updating. That could have just been a coincidence, but honestly, we feel like we're being put at the bottom of the list for filling positions and getting anything else that the district is providing. Are we being set up to fail? With the conversations of reconfiguration looming over us, we feel undermined. We need these positions filled as much as all the other schools need theirs filled. Why aren't resources in the district being distributed evenly? Every day staff show up and schedules are reorganized to meet student needs. Who's covering this duty? Can't be the person that we signed up for because now we have this going on. It's a juggling show every single day at our school and it's really frustrating. Thank you, Laura Lee. We're gonna move into the rest of our meeting right now, and I know that it's really not satisfactory and it's not for the board. We listen to your comments, we take them really seriously, we don't comment back. If there's any additional comments, please feel free to submit it in, in writing, and there will be speaking periods after this one. We're gonna move into our configuration data presentation, and after that configuration data presentation, because we have a really long meeting today, we're gonna to have a short break. Then we're going to move into the board operations part, and after board operations, which is fairly lengthy, we're going to have ten, a 10-minute ten break, and then we're going to move into the last part of the board so that the board members can sort of adjust and have a little bit of a break. So with that, Stephen. Great. Thank you, Floor. Thank you, board. And thank you, community, for showing up for, um, for our meeting. I... Um, I took the information uh, that we had from Monday. There was a group of us that met as part of the reconfiguration committee. And I, I actually took some of this information, I split it up into two parts of our, our night tonight. So I tried to address um, in this first part is some of the enrollment and criteria matrix pieces as part of this part of the presentation. And then we have the budget part of the presentation when we get into the board operations. So I just want the people that were here on Monday or, or were a part of that, that will um, you'll you'll see that uh, that that that's uh, we're we're kind of splitting up that information. All right, so I'm going to share my screen right now and um, start our presentation. All right, so whoops, let me get to first page. All right, so um, so as I said, this part of the presentation is really going to focus on the enrollment updates. Um, I would agree with some of the comments that were made for the community is that we're, we're really working at getting um, accurate data and I, I, the group that was here Monday night heard me say we've got some rough numbers that we're trying to really get honed in on. So we spent the last two days making sure that we really updated our enrollment um, so that we could answer some of those questions and you can see some of that information in this uh, presentation. Um, and so we'll also take a moment to review the um, criteria matrix and, um, and, and look at some of that information as well. Yep. All right, so uh, just a reminder, our goals of the strategic plan, we have three goals that we are focused on. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these for us. Um, and then our district values and beliefs is just keeping those at the forefront of our thinking as well. Um, those were what our drivers were to build the goals for our strategic plan. So this is our updated uh, enrollment projections is where I would really direct you to the third column of the left-hand um, group of, of information. So you see I put in for reference physical year 15, physical year 25 is what we are in right now. Those numbers are updated as of today. And our physical year 26 is the roll up of our student populations that exist in our schools right now. And so with a few assumptions around pre-kindergarten that we, we usually just say we're going to have the same number of pre-kindergarten kids um, next year as we did this year because that's the best estimates that we can usually use on those. And then there's the, those projected enrollments for, uh, for further out are really based on the NESDEC numbers from a few years ago. But those were the numbers that were there. You can see more specifically down there at the bottom 
Um, if you want to follow that NASDAQ 2022 link, it will give you some of that information as well. And so you can see there that our total pre-K-6 projected enrollment next year is going to be 619 students, 647 of them this year. And uh, at U32, uh, the uh, enrollment projections is 7685. If you notice, those are pre-K through 6 um, enrollment numbers for those schools. So we're, we're assuming that the 6th grade is there um, next year in those numbers. Because right, we go back and forth a few times between pre-K-5 and pre-K-6, so I'll try to make sure that I'm clear when we're doing that. Um, right, so this is the current class configuration and the class sizes across our district. We've used this for illustrative purposes to just show how we're configured right at the moment. Um, we've seen this one a few times. And this is our current staffing across the district. That's actually... Uh, it's probably off of by a couple of FTEs simply because we've been hiring. I, I heard the concern there. We are working on getting people placed in any open position as we speak. And then we, um, and then this is a slide that we have used several times. Um, we have fully updated this. This is not what we have seen before. We also included the pre-K numbers on this so that we have a better view of the proposed classroom configuration with three <coughs> schools. And so this slide itself um, really reflects today's data on how many students that we have. And so you can see that there were some pretty big adjustments to the numbers that we have there. The E's stand for East Montpelier, the M's for Middlesex, the B for Berlin in each of those. The pre-K classes, I would just point out, those, each of those classes is a half-day class. And so while I put that there are five classes there for pre-K, um, the total classrooms at the bottom represent 31 and a half, so that's the total number of rooms that you would need. So we would only need one room for half a day uh, to do this model right here. I want to give the board a minute to take a look at this because this is the uh, and the community because this really is a pretty big update to uh, to the numbers that we've been showing. Just a question on the pre-K, the, the um, half days, are they doubling up so it's one, so for, for so, Berlin, say it's 12 kids in the morning, 12 kids in the p.m.? Correct, okay. correct. And so East Montpelier, 13 kids in the morning, 13 kids in the afternoon. We, we do not go into discussing the wraparound that community connections might provide. That's not, that's not uh, illustrated in this. That would be um, really more of our budget discussion about the, what we do for those classes. Um, you'll see I have a classroom configuration here, how many classrooms we have. We'll have that slide as well in just a moment, so that'll help you with that. I any other questions about this one as you're looking at it, board? I just want to make sure because it, it is very different. Mm -hmm. Stephen, I have a question about the enrollment numbers. Yes. They look really different for fiscal year 26. They do. But the source you give is the same? No, no. NES, NESDEC is the like the future projections that are out there. The physical year 26. So you're talking about this last slide uh, that we just looked at. Let yeah. me just make sure I can. Can we give page number three? Um, Oops. Five. Five. Sorry. Yeah. So you're talking about this slide. That physical year 26 is based upon the current students that we have in the district, and um, an assumption that we will have the same number of pre-K kids next year that we have this year. Okay? All right, so I'm going to pop back to slide number eight. All right. All right, so um, also I'll say I added to this slide just down there at the bottom where it says East Montpelier, there's 14, Middlesex 10, and Berlin 10. Those are the number of, of rooms that would be needed for if we did this particular thing. So I want to stress that because um, I, I can, I'm going to foreshadow a question that's coming here, which is um, this is all straight grade levels, but we see a class of eight kids in first grade um, at Middlesex, and then we two, see two classes of uh, 12 and 13 at Middlesex in second grade. Um, if you look at, um, at both kindergarten, first, and second grade at Middlesex, the organization of those kids can be multi-age if we so think that that is necessary. I, I just want to, we've never said that multi-age classrooms aren't acceptable. We've said we don't, we haven't done any policy around that. We have illustrated our class sizes with this graph. 
And so if we so choose to do multi-age classes, that's fine. We do them now. We just need to be thoughtful about how we do them. And, and really, I would say that the elementary principals and their staffs are the best people to talk about what's the best for the kids at that. All right, so I'm going to move forward. Um, so this is the building <coughs> configurations capacity. So this was an update to um, to this. Uh, I went over these charts with our principals just to make sure that we were talking about the right number of classrooms and, and that we were using them uh, the ways we thought. So Berlin is the example. There are 13 um, classrooms in the building, but does not include their art and music room. So those are two separate. That would be 15 total rooms in the school. And we are projected to need 10 classrooms pre-K through 5. So that's the pre-K through 5 enrollments being used for that. You can see at Middlesex there, the projected enrollments, 150 students for next year. That would require, um, they have nine classrooms that do not include this, the art and music classrooms. So they would need nine classrooms for multi-age groupings of that maybe the first and second grade or 10 single grade classes. I would also point out uh, with Doty, there's a double asterisk there. They use the same room for music and art. And so um, they have uh, seven classrooms plus that additional classroom for music and art. All right, I know a lot we're taking in because it's changed some. So the other piece of our conversation um, that we talked about on, uh, on Monday was related to the criteria, which um, we shared with the board. There's actually a part of your packet, the, the criteria. And um, we updated most of it. We can partially meet in many areas um, what those requirements are. Between Monday and now, we were not able to draw together all of the data to, to support each and every one of those boxes, but we did make sure that we, um, we tried to be as honest as possible about some of these meet criteria and some of them don't. Oh yeah, I'm sorry, I'm holding it like it's, it's yeah, in this packet. My apologies. Um, we were able to talk more uh, with transportation. Um, they do not think that there is going to be a significant change in the number of buses that we would have. In fact, they don't really foresee any change in the number of buses uh, right now in the way that we're structured. They would just run different routes. Um, and so, uh, so they did not want to commit to uh, saying, yeah, we could cut out several buses. Uh, mostly the, the talk around uh, the Middlesex and Worcester area is just simply the number of miles that need to be covered. Um, the same number of buses would be needed for, for that mileage. Um, and so, uh, so transportation, travel times would not change um, drastically um, for, for students because we would have a different pickup route instead of having a loop for some of our towns like a Callis or a Worcester. Um, those would be direct um, routes into the school and pick up from both towns. And so there's not a significant change on travel time that they admitted. And one of our other criteria that we, we talked about was travel time for families. Um, the only configuration that really posed a problem for, for the distance for families and for buses was the possibility of having Berlin as an early learning center and just having two elementary schools. And that's one of the reasons why we really have not pursued that much further. The travel time has really got a little too much. Yeah, and we added, uh, after the feedback, I watched the video, and after the feedback, we added those 30 minutes. That was not something that we talked about. We don't have policy that says travel time for families should be 30 minutes, but that is sort of the average from the furthest point to the furthest school. So. And this is definitely a chart. If you notice, it's split up into two pieces, the cr criteria related to student well-being and opportunities and the criteria related to fiscal responsibility, sustainability, and impacts on communities and towns. I would also say that we have not defined what sustainability is to us over the long term. So, um, so that is something that if we were to, to move most of those out of the, uh, the yellow, it would probably be a better definition of those things. Yeah, and with some of the more refined data from finance, we, we could be able to talk yeah. about like refining that table. But this Mm -hmm. We left it like this from the feedback that you guys gave on Monday. Yeah. So hopefully it reflects what you discussed. 
right. So, I, Monday we have a lot of information about the budget that's going to come with the budget information. But that was our, that helped us look at the enrollment, some of those projections in those classrooms, which changed some of that. I think it, it helps you see the pre-K question that had come up uh, about how do we, how, how might we do that and what might it look like. Um, but certainly observations, implications, any questions about this data that I can try to help with. So, a couple of questions. One, mm -hmm. um, because I know there was a question about cla uh, classrooms available mm -hmm. and, um, and thinking around the configuration, things that we're considering in terms of cla classrooms available is somewhat contingent on sixth grade moving on. Well, it, absolutely. And so what uh, ballpark-wise is potentially, if if we did say we wanted sixth graders back in our elementary buildings, then I think the question that I kept hearing too was, are there still the classrooms available? Should that become part of the conversation? Are, are you saying within the three model that we keep the sixth grade with the, if we were to model this with three elementary schools? Would it work for any? So it would definitely work for five because we have available space, um, but it would probably not work if fully for three. That would be one of those where we might be able to make it work in one building, but not in all of them. Then the, the other question, I appreciate all of the work that went into the criteria and the different mm -hmm. uh, models that were suggested. Uh, a wondering I have, though, is sometimes it's a little bit about perspective. So when we looked at um, the one that was talking about, um, sorry, I just gave my hand. Um, when we uh, looked at, when you look at the three elementary pre-K to five, you know how it all green. Um, mm -hmm. The only thing I wonder about is do we really have enough data to say that access to enrichment opportunities and elementary sports is really met? I don't know that we have enough data. So that is just a, a, a wondering. Okay. Thank you. I was Thank wondering you. the same thing. Um, if this were a web page, I would want to click each of these colored boxes and we'd see the evidence that supports the assessment that was made. And we will be working on trying to get you as much of that. We introduced this on Monday, so between Monday and here. I yeah, I just, uh, thank you. And I actually think that one thing that we can think about as board members is that we've been talking a lot about, for example, if sixth grade were to move to user two, they would have the opportunity to have language. So little things that we don't have all of the actual data yet, but you know, yeah, they're increasing the opportunities for the sixth graders to be able to have a foreign language. And and similarly on sports and music, we've been you know the models that they've been setting for like the three schools, it sort of responds to that criteria that we created, and part of that criteria was extending those opportunities. So so yeah. some of it is not like you know so so we used all of that to to try to get to the best color, and I know that it's not perfect yet, but those are just a few that we as a board have talked about and are you know, real. Yeah. Okay, so if there's no more questions from the board, I'll ask well, the Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I know you said that if we did I think some of the information that we had about 10 classrooms taken up at Middlesex, um, mm -hmm. right. yeah, I'll would show that you. mean that then one of the art or music rooms would be going on? So if the, um, let me just get to that one. Yeah, so in this one, so if we were to decide that multi-age were okay, nine classrooms would be fine. But if we, if we felt that 10, uh, or that we would need 10 classrooms if we wanted single grade level uh, in that case, yes, we would need to make use of either the art or the music room for an additional classroom. And so those two would have to combine up into one room. And then the, those classroom numbers are based on their only being half day preschool and pre K available. So, so yes. Yeah, so I, I'll speak a little bit to it, and it's I don't want to don't 
quote me on exactly what we would end up with, but we would say with the pre-K, Berlin, so I'm showing those numbers right there. So the two Berlin classes, so there'd be a classroom dedicated to pre-K, so a morning group and an afternoon group, and there'd be another classroom that could be dedicated to community connections. There are plenty of classroom spaces for that. Same with East Montpelier. There are enough classroom spaces to do a pre-K class and that. At uh, Middlesex, there are only eight students that we would that we are currently projecting for pre-K. Um, a total. Total. And so you would have a morning a morning program of pre-K and an afternoon program of of community connections in the same classroom. Yeah. Does that last point jive with with the um, the the four year olds being brought into full full day uh, education in our buildings? So uh, we haven't modeled it for that um, because we really don't know how that's going to look yet. What are will we be required also to do the three year olds um, and what is that? So I don't I really don't have enough data to give you a good answer on that one, other than to say that there's a good chance that we'll have four year olds full day at some point in time. Um, so if there were 10 single grades mm -hmm. at Middlesex and the art music share room, what implications does that have for the program and for art and music? I would really need Caroline to just speak more directly to that. I don't know if she's online, but, um, but the program itself, there is no, they don't need the classroom for five full days for either one of the programs, for art or music. So they would just have to develop a schedule to where art was in there on some days and music was on other days. But there would not be a need to have the classroom full time for five days to be able to deliver the art program and the music programs that we currently have. Okay. Um, and then my other question is, in order for this classroom configuration to work as you present. I just want to make sure I'm clear. That's fine. The sixth grade has to move to U32. If so we, the sixth if, grade doesn't move to U32, none of this works. So it becomes most problematic at Middlesex. If the sixth grade is still with the elementary schools, the, the, the classroom configuration at Middlesex would not allow it. And it would be, it would be tough actually at East, East Montpelier, I think as well. I'm not sure about Berlin. So Steve, oh yeah, I'm sorry. You talked about the bus routes. Um, bus being really not transportation not being the same as of any kind. It sounds like you know, it, it, it. It didn't appear from my my conversations with our bus company that there was really any savings. Um, because don't forget this year we cut back on some of our busing and I think that we're reaching a point where the distances traveled are what are driving the number of buses that we need at this point in time is what it sounded like. Do these routes take into consideration any uh, reassignment of students across town lines to a closer elementary school. So, it, can I be more specific with your question and what I think you're asking? Uh, and you tell me. So, there are some students that live in Middlesex that are actually closer to Berlin because of where Route Two is, uh, where they're where they're located on Route Two. Um, we have not made any. I mean, the bus company said that might change a few things. There's not that many students that sit in those areas to change up transportation drastically. It would change up your classroom configurations, um, but probably not by a lot of kids. There's just not that many kids in each of those kinds of locations. Okay. Um, in, in, in the um, event that Dodi stays open, mm -hmm. uh, would that, uh, in terms of proximity of, of college students to Dodi, um, would that have an impact on busing? If, if, Students that live in Calais are actually closer to Doty than a longer ride. Uh, would they be reassigned to Doty? I think that would be a board decision to make at that point in time as to how um, how we reconfigure. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. One more. Go ahead, Diane. Uh, or, no, go ahead. Um, so I just wondered about the capacity and potential need for any modifications. If sixth grade did move. I know we've talked in theory about it, but um, so there over the summer, say we say we're the moving and over the summer would there be any modifications or building changes that needed to happen? So I don't want to speak for Becca, but just from my old hat as the uh, as the principal here, is that when we looked at it, there were no major modifications that needed to be done for the sixth grade to be here. The total number of students is that much less than what it was several years ago when we were running a full middle school um, on, in seventh and eighth grade, full building. Okay. 
well, not full, but bigger. So I uh, appreciate the uh, liberal use of the blue, where you don't have enough information. Um, but I want to poke a little bit on the um, uh, property values, community well-being, and impact count. Mm -hmm. um, and, and why none of those are, are filled in? Which page? Can you tell us what page, Patrick? Yeah, I think four. On the four and five. I, so I would say right now we and, and this will be a bigger part of our discussion I think when we talk about the budget is that we are really working with projections and estimates and we really don't quite know yet like we, we're so as I was putting this some of these uh, slideshows together we're a month earlier than we were last year in terms of our budget in for you know budget work and that was a month earlier than the year before so we've moved up our budgeting two months from what we used to do it just two years ago and as a result we have a lot of estimates but we don't have a lot of firm numbers so it's really we felt it was better to just say we don't really know this information yet um, and I don't know that we can predict property values or things like that I don't know that that's our data to be able to gather I don't know where I would find it yeah and I, and I will add to that Patrick after reflecting about what you guys talked about on Monday some some of this in the in the five in the three and just to put on my glasses on the on the five elementary schools uh, were initially uh, yellow and some were initially red and from the feedback that you guys gave we felt like we really needed to have more of this budget conversation and get a little bit more data before being able to totally decide if it's you know fiscally sustainable and then the one that is constantly been the district community schools we had left that not enough information not because we don't believe on that because it would depend on which model because that would be a layer that we would put to help all our schools right so but if we have three schools in one middle school and one high school then we will layer the community school into that and what does that mean right where could we provide some efficiencies or where could we have a, you know, telemedicine, whatever it is, community involved in our schools. So it's not because we don't want it, it's just it would depend on which model we would pick because we do want to have community schools. Yeah, I guess my question is more about the, like we, we know from um, just the way the property value works that closing a school is going to change the property value in a town. I think yeah. we can say that that's mm -hmm. going to happen. Yeah. I think we can say that a community um, is going to be impacted by their local uh, local school being being closed, and so I, I think we should be honest about um, about those impacts in, in this in this chart. I think it would, it so would, where would, where would you see that one in property values? Is where your yeah I think property values, uh, community viability, and impact to towns would be um, would be negatively impacted by closing a school. So any any of the, the configurations that are less than five pre K. So. I don't mean to interrupt, Patrick. I'm sorry. Go ahead. That was, that was oh, okay. I, I was just going to say um, it would help me to know where we can go for like data sure. for that piece, so that I can just you know because that's the question that I'm asked is how do I find what's the data that supports each of these, and so I I just don't know where to go to find. A, I mean, I know there are major research studies, but I don't I haven't seen the data for Vermont and what's happened, um, particularly post pandemic. Yeah. Yeah, so and, and I not that I'm doubting it, I just don't know. Yeah, fair. <coughs> Hold on one minute, Chris, because yeah, mm -hmm. Ursula and then Natasha and then you. I was gonna wonder if we could look at towns in Vermont that have closed in the past and see what was his like what happened to them and their property taxes, because that could give us information that is local and, yeah. and I'm just thinking that it's a way to take a look at what has happened in the past to guide us as opposed to making assumptions. Are you suggesting I would be making assumptions? Do you have information? I mean, Stephen's asked where to find it. Do you have an answer? I have a note that says look for some research. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, so then right now, yeah. saying that it will decline them yeah. is an assumption. Yeah. We'll find it. Yeah, we'll, I mean, there's references in the letter that Worcester mm -hmm. provided that speaks to that. So that's a place you can start. Right. Yeah. Fair. Natasha? Um, two questions. One, on page four, yeah. with resilient and response to future oh. demographic changes. Oh, I'm just I'm curious that if we go down to three elementary schools and our population increases, um, are those buildings, as is, able to absorb additional students? Um, because I believe, I don't know if it was the whistleblower, one of the things, many, many things I read today 
talked about the capacity, and with the three schools, the capacity is now almost at 100%. So if, if populations start growing, is there the ability to add more students into those buildings without having to build more or put mm -hmm. trailers on the property? Mm -hmm. um, my other question is, under same page, sets us up to enter merger conversations with another district. You do not have enough data if we have more than three elementary schools. I'm just curious as to why having more elementary schools would impact our ability to have conversations with other districts about a merger. Do you want me to go or do you want to go? Uh, I'll, I'll let you answer. I mean, <laughs> so I, I, I'll, I'll take it. So the, um, so the conversations that that we had just as preliminary conversations with getting our boards together to have that is one of the issues with mergers is taking on the small school um, the cost of small schools is is one of the the concerns that other districts would have and we we had the same concern um, back during act 46 around taking on roxbury as well so it was it's not our own district considered that at one point in time but small schools are can can be expensive and so it does affect that I, I hear that and also the small schools were the two schools that didn't carry any debt in the district so it doesn't seem like yeah, the small I, schools are the ones that are actually contributing in that sense so, I'm just so I would I would also I'm, and I'm, I'm not trying to push back too much but just a little bit here is That's that okay. I push back all the time I know um, so we have as a district spent money on capital improvements on those uh, facilities on Doty and on Callis during the last since the merger um, that would uh, possibly required an increase in taxes if it were a single town a single um, district at the time so the district has committed to, to spending capital uh, money on the upgrade of those buildings was there disproportionate spending to those smaller schools than to the other schools I don't have those numbers in yeah, and I think we can go in that, in right. that rabbit hole in that yeah. in that question I think that we hashed the question about that for many 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 months it, when we were merged when we were doing a merger so can I address uh, yeah, the, because the other question was about building capacity, capacity. Yeah. I think that there are two p parts of the capacity that I think that we we can explore um, as we think about this is not only the number of classrooms which is a is a big consideration but also the class sizes that we have within those buildings so when you look and you see um, in in the uh, in the I, I'm going to use East Montpelier third grade um, there's two classrooms that are that are 16 and 17 so you can absorb a few more kids into those classes right not that you're gonna if if i had a huge influx of students right so if we had 20 kids move in to the to the district and all went to one school at one grade level that might prove problematic for us um, but we can absorb um, increases in kids at small increments Right, because of our class size ability, right? So we would go from class sizes of 13 or 14 to 15 or 16. Or 22 to 25. Or 22 to 25. Which is outside what our district and then And that would and that would require us to look at a different solution to that problem, rather than just putting them in that classroom. Do we split into multi-age, or do we have just two classrooms? Decisions that we make now yes. in this current configuration. I, okay. <laughs> So. I just got to say two things. One, mm -hmm. you have mentioned a couple times tonight that multi-age classrooms are a consideration, yet it seems like the conversation around what is a viable classroom has hinted at multi-age classrooms not being the best way to educate our kids. And now there's comments that, well, if we have to do it, we can, and it can work, but we're currently doing it and it's working. So it, that just that just kind of sounds. So that's a, that's just an observation. That I'm not asking for a response. It's just okay. an observation. The other observation I have um, is, and this is not probably not a helpful observation, but um, you know you can make data support whatever argument you wanted to support, and so we've got greens across the board with the two models that you have been pushing forward since this configuration process has started um, and a lot of unknowns in the other models um, partially because we haven't had the same time to look at those other models 
I appreciate all the work that's been put into this and I do appreciate the side by side, but I also think that there's a lot of stuff that's being left out and isn't telling a complete story. Okay. And again, that's just an observation I'm making. So Thank you. Chris and then Ursula. So there's a little bit of a discussion about assumptions on certain items. Um, from what I'm, I'm hearing, most of what we're projecting is an assumption. Um, I, I don't think we have any really concrete uh, numbers in terms of what the savings will be from, from closing the schools, um, what additional programming will be provided, uh, whether the um, potential savings are sustainable, what period of time, we're not willing to, to make that. So, you know, we're making decisions on a lot of assumptions that are not concrete, in my view, uh, and it's, it's you know, the kind of concern is who's going to take the risk of, the, of a faulty assumption or a wrong assumption. Um, and it, to follow up on Natasha's question about the burgeoning potential population increase, uh, would a solution be busing kids from, like, a Rumney school, uh, if it was a Rumney Doty school, um, or some other name because it was combined, over to East Montpelier or to Berlin because they have more room? Uh, would that be a potential safety valve or relief valve for an overpopulated school in in that district, for, in that at that location, for instance? Again, an assumption, uh, but that's what we're dealing with here, I think. Well, I, uh, similar to, I think, the approach that we took with pre-K and K and Rumney and Doty for this year because of their small sizes, is that we combine them up. And so that, that sounds like the same question, right? It's a little different because it's being bought sized out as opposed to mm -hmm. combining because it's undersized. Yep. Yeah. But similar process. So I was going to address the situation of the combined classes versus straight level classes. I don't think we've heard ever anybody saying that straight level classes, straight grade classes are better. They have said intentional mixed grades is what's ideal. Doing it with intention and having a plan is what's ideal. What we end up with, which is a varying grade mix year to year in response to our populations, is very difficult to provide quality it's curriculum. It's intentional though. Yeah. I mean, yeah. our educators are thinking very thoughtfully about what those combined classes are going to look like mm -hmm. and how they're going to provide instruction for them. I so even though it may have to be a year by year decision, it's still intentional yeah, so about how to meet the needs of the students. So I would appreciate if each of you would just let each other finish. So Ursula, go ahead and finish, and then and then we can move on to the so next I guess question. Nothing I was saying was saying that they weren't intentional. It's setting out for an intentional like developed policy on mixed grades versus reactionary year to year. Nobody's saying that our administrators aren't intentional. Our, in, our administrators spend a large amount of time trying to figure out what is best for our students. And I think that we as a board need to take that into consideration too. Okay, any other questions from board members? Sorry, I could. No, I just to talk. No. You're good? I'm good. Okay. Uh, I'll stop this share and we'll, we'll stop we'll stop the share and then I just wanted to bring us back to that capacity question that you you were asking and Patrick you did that graph and then we read that graph and none of our schools are at capacity so we're just going to want to leave that lingering in in there so we are all going to open it up for 15 minutes for public comment uh, considering the presentation that just went by and that just was presented not went by it was just presented so we're going to have a few minutes and I see that we have one hand already uh, online and he, we have two three in person Four. so I'm gonna I'm gonna start with the uh, Lila online and then I'm gonna move into in person okay go ahead Lila okay uh, Lila Richardson from Worcester um, I was intending to give comments about um, ongoing concerns about class size and configuration that would exist in the combined Romney and Doty school. And I was basing my comments on information that was presented on Monday evening and was not updated until right before this meeting. So I'm at a terrible disadvantage in trying to talk about the new information, which is extremely difficult 
as relates to class size and class configuration. Um, another Worcester resident and I spent time uh, putting together a letter to the board that was posted earlier today. Um, and I'm sure the answers are gonna be, well, that's based on outdated data. It's very, very frustrating. Um, and I would say one of the things that could have been cleared up a long time ago was the number of classrooms for basic instruction versus art and music. We've been asking that for over a month. Um, one reaction that I have to the new figures, which are, as I said, very, very different from what um, was presented before, is that up until now, the number of pre-K students in uh, Romney and Doty combined was estimated at 20. This year it's 18, and for some reason next year you're saying eight, even though you say that that should be based on what this year is. So I cannot understand the pre-K figures that you're currently giving. Thank you, Lara. I'm going to, we have two other people online, but I'm going to move to take turns. So go ahead, Chani. Is that? Yeah. Hi, this is Chani again. Um, I wanted to speak to the idea that small schools are expensive. I handed out um, a slide that was shared on Monday night during the Finance Committee meeting, which shows per pupil date spending data by school. It's the first time we've been able to look at these numbers in a really long time. Um, I want to highlight that Doty still has relatively low per pupil spending in our district. In fact, it's our smallest school, but it, we're spending essentially the same amount per pupil as Berlin and U32, the largest schools in our district. Historically, this was also um, the trend for Doty. It's really time to stop making the argument that we can't afford small schools when our data shows that we can if we adapt. Thank you. Thank you. There's somebody not muted. Oh, I'll get it. Okay, it does. He's good. Yeah. Somebody's not muted. Got it. Okay, okay. okay we're, I'm going to do one online. Uh, Laura Lee. If you want to go ahead and unmute yourself. Yes, hi. Um, let's see. So I'm a Berlin resident, the mom of a U32, U32 student and a teacher in Calais. I have experience teaching in both small schools and a larger school. From my experiences, the larger the school, the less individuality from students. Kids are not supported as strongly in a larger school because they become more of a number anywhere outside of their own classroom. Their teacher knows them best and that's about it. Integrative arts, cafeteria staff, paraprofessionals, any classroom teacher besides their own covering a duty such as recess, lunch, and many other folks throughout the school will have many more students to get to know and work with and they won't be able to do that well there will be less individualized support across settings. The community feel of our building won't be as strong either. Um, I knew that moving to a small school to teach from that larger school that I came from would be harder. There would be less support for sharing duties. I'd have to step up to more committees because there'd be less people to take on being um, the representation from my building and there'd be less folks to collaborate with. But the feel of the community in a smaller school isn't something that's like the community in a larger school. It just isn't. And I can't tell you enough how that impacts student learning and the everyday attitude of people showing up. There may be advantages to merging schools, but an enormous loss would be the caring and supportive community that a small school creates. The individualization of instruction and social emotional support for students the welcoming and warm community every day when those students walk in our building, seeing the faces of every person they know, the names of every person really matters. And that will be lost in a larger school setting. I'm fairly, I feel confident. I think it's fair to say at U32, there are lots of teachers who don't know each other well and students who don't know each other for certain, even in my son's grade level, he doesn't know all the kids. That's gonna be lost in a larger school. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, back to here, about was that, who else had their hand up? Okay, go ahead, there's. Hi, 
Hi, my name is Chrissy Pollard. I'm a Worcester resident and um, a mother of Doty students. Um, I just wanted to go back to the information about preschool projected numbers for next year. Um, like Lila brought up, I'm not sure where the eight students between Middlesex and Worcester comes from. Um, but I just wanted to point out that when um, Stephen did say that there might be a community connections that would make it an all-day program, when Doty had a full day program for preschool, between Doty Preschool and Community Connections, our numbers were much larger. And I worry that if that is going to be the plan for Middlesex and you're only preparing a room for eight students, that um, we are going to, you will have to turn away students or put them on a waiting list. And so then we might be saying to Worcester um, families, not only are we closing your school, but now you don't get to go to the preschool in the next closest town. Um, and when the preschool program meets the needs of the families as opposed to the needs of the district, the numbers are higher. And so I think we should just keep that in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Deborah Bloom. Hello. Um, I am, my name is Deborah Bloom, and I'm a Worcester resident. I'm a parent of two children at Doty. I have the slide of the graph behind me that Chani just referenced. Regarding the uh, per pupil cost, you see Doty is right there, one of the lowest alongside Berlin. When all the data provided is viewed side by side, here's what I see. The two schools with the greatest declines in enrollment and highest per pupil cost in the wealthier towns are poised to keep their local schools. While the school with the most stable enrollment and one of the lowest costs per pupil in the town with the lowest medium household income is on the chopping block. Are you proposing closing Doty and Callis to make the two schools in the wealthier towns financially viable? It appears so. Why is the burden of our district's budget struggles once again being laid on the back of the poorest community? Last time I said the board's proposed three school model reeks of classism. What I see now after looking all the data is systemic classism. In a letter to our community this fall, our superintendent wrote, when it comes to education, more is more and more is better. After reviewing the data and attending our open house last week, I hope he will change his narrative. Small can be beautiful, efficient, and effective at providing quality education within a student's local community and support the district to focus more on quality than quantity and on keeping our youngest ones closer to home. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we have one more person, yeah, two more people. Um, so Bo and then JL and, and then... Did you? I think we have... Bo Carey, Worcester resident. I taught at U32 yeah. for... 27 years. Uh, all of the class sizes we're seeing are on the elementary school model. We haven't talked about U32, and we're talking about equity. And I know some people who teach required courses have very large numbers of students on their role that they interact with. And I think there are other class sizes that are not necessarily very large. And I think it would be good to look at U32 and see how equitable the teaching roles are for individual teachers here and look at that so that we're not just looking at an elementary school class size. Um, small schools are very agile and fluid. And I think the community letter that was submitted um, speaks volumes. To me, consolidation means organizing and putting things together. But in order to consolidate things, you have to separate. And I just think the separation that will happen in Callis and Worcester will affect many facets of the community. And you're pulling the thread, and you're not just unraveling the number of kids who are going to get bused to another school, but all different parts of the fabric that make a community. Thank you.
Jael. Yeah, just introduce yourself, Jael. Yeah. Hi, ladies, my name is Jael. Um, I'm from Worcester. So I have more of a question. Um, you know, my understanding is that this whole thing happened, started, this whole process started because the budget was too high and the towns voted the budget down. And just looking at the budget, I see, you know, that our electricity expenses are really high and our oil. And so my question is, like, first, what are you doing to reduce the budget and your expenses? And did the district apply for IRA funds to help get solar and um, heat pumps and reduce our electricity costs? Because I've been seeing um, stories throughout this country of school districts accessing those grant funds and reducing their costs. So just wondering if the school board looked at those grants and using them to help reduce our costs. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, it's Lauren Schwell again. Um, I guess I just have two comments in um, response to this. One echoes uh, Chrissy's statement about pre-K. My daughter was able to attend when pre-K was full-time at Doty. She would not have been able to as two full-time working parents if it was not full-time. And because of that, as a young uh, kindergartner, she was able to enter kindergarten ready to learn. She was already part of the Doty community. I think not investing in pre-K is short-sighted. My second comment on the data is I really caution the district to filling schools to capacity. I think the capacity numbers set by the state are not um, realistic. I would teach in a crowded school. I'm sure we meet the state capacity standards, but it is not effective, safe, fun, enjoyable um, for students or teachers to be in a very full school. There is simply not enough space. You need space for intervention groups, um, <laughs> all sorts of things. And when your school is at capacity, you don't have the space. We need to be thinking about the future far from now, and um, I'm concerned about capacity. Um, Noah Weinstein, Worcester again. Um, just briefly, I think the, the two words that come to mind right now are trust and care. This is what we expect from the board and all of the administrators and all of our teachers for our most precious beings. These numbers do not show trust and care. They're sloppy. That the that the capacity numbers, that the that the enrollment numbers have changed so significantly. These have been numbers that have been available since April, in that in two days they've shifted by how many percent? I think that the finance data is coming next. I was at the meeting on Monday. Like they're putting this together in two days. So I just don't know what to trust. Thank you. Kaylin Walensky, um, I have some question about the transportation. You specified that there was no significant travel changes for the buses. What does that mean for the Doty students who currently have 90 minute rides? Are you saying that they will be more on average with the rest of the district who has more buses available to their schools? And I would love to know specifically what that time would be. Uh, and you're saying there's no transportation savings. Is there going to be pre-K specific transportation or are they going to be on buses with the older kids? Uh, and then in terms of being able to absorb more students into classrooms, if there's an increase in student population, even if that ex exceeds um, recommendations, you know, you're saying that possibly you could bus children to a different school. I am that pressure valve already. My pre-K student is three years old, and she is now in a different community. She is away from her sibling. She is away from everybody who knows her in her community. Uh, and she is well cared for by her teachers. I am not saying that whatsoever. They are incredible professionals. But she is outside of her community. She is the pressure valve. She cried on her first day of school because she couldn't go to Doji as she expected, as well as her friends did, as well as the people who were in pre-K-4 had the opportunity to do when they were in pre-K-3. Uh, I have two students in two communities. I have two students in two schools. If I get an alert from pickup call, it doesn't tell me what school my student has had a change for. So I seem to get a change and I have to figure out which child is this talking about. It's not appropriate. My child belongs in her community. She's free. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, Lena. Um, 
Thank you. We're, we're done with this part of the meeting just for right now. We're going to take a five minute break. Oh, there's someone one in the flower dress. Okay. Oh, go ahead. I'd like to echo that student's perspective from 50 years later. I went to Maple Water School, I went to North Dallas School, and then I was tuition to Berlin for seventh and eighth grade. You can't beat local education, and it is crazy to think about closing in the two schools that were you know, financially viable. I can't believe you're considering doing this. Thank you. I should have said Cindy Gardino's palace. Thank you, Cindy. Okay. We're, we're going to take a five-minute break, and then we're going to move into our operations for the night. Okay? We're going to move right into board operations. We have our students here with us tonight, which we should celebrate, and they are all anxious to go to the soccer game. So we are now on board operations, and the first point of order in board operations or point of order celebration is that we're going to appoint our students. So I'm going to open that to our user to principal, if I'm not wrong. And Becca, Becca was here just a minute ago. Oh, oh, oh. She, she stepped in. Oh. 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 No. No. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody online, please like mute themselves. <laughs> here, she there, here she comes. <laughs> Becca, we were hoping that you could introduce our um, newest uh, student board rep. Thank you. Um, hi everyone. I'm really excited um, to introduce and have our first student report. Um, the young people in our community who step into this role really exhibit a certain level of leadership and interest in the ways in which um, you have our whole school board operates and our community, and so you heard talk who's a senior, congratulations, and we're going to get her out to the soccer game in a little bit um, to cheer on, but her work as a school board rep yet last year was really impressive, and she has really taken an initiative in this year, and you hear that in the way that you speak in this space, and only your your voice as a student at U32, but also as a member of the Slugger community. Um, and so the process by which we use, we have board members come to us as students is that we put out a call, they apply, and then we look at some of those traits of leadership um, and their commitment to this broader vision or this broader work. And so Lay, um, who's a junior, is going to join us as our junior rep um, I met, yeah, congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
Um, I'll be brief, but I think that one of the things that I met like, when I was first year interviewing, and you were a member of student council, and you um, you have taken an interest in the broadness of the offerings at U32. So from community-based learning to football to the school board, you are really. Um, you really carry that representation, and so we're really excited to have you in this role. Um, and thank you to the board for giving the wall space for folks, and also honoring that they are students first. Thank you. Thank you, Becky. Okay. Okay. With that, I'm looking for a motion from the board to appoint Leah Groot to our board. I'll so, to Ursula and, oh, oh sorry, Michelle Moset yeah. and Ursula. Let Natasha sign Natasha her hand up, too. Uh, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Congratulations. And now you can Welcome. give the student update. You two are ready, and then you can, we can get you out in the field. Thank you for being here with us. Of course. Um, Use the mic. Oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Thank you. Um, all right. I think I'm going to be giving the first student report of the year, just so we can get it done, like we can't do it. Um, <laughs> first we're going to talk about sports. There is two soccer games that happened today. Um, we're playing Montpelier, so we're doing pink out, that's why I have face paint on my face. Um, the girls won. <laughs> um, the boys are currently losing 2-0, which is extremely unfortunate but today um we have a field hockey game tomorrow um it's gonna be great we have a football game saturday golf had a tournament recently i do not recall the exact date cross country is killing it as usual the champions are here um we just started school fun um picture day was last week oh last week i believe um, Stage 32, which are musical signups are open, which is great. Um, have squad spirit, like I said, today's pink out, so people are showing up. We got a little student section out there. And then we just wanted to put out a reminder a lot of stuff is changing right now. This is for every single person in this room. A lot of stuff is changing right now. Everybody has to be patient and kind and adaptive because there's a lot of really difficult decisions that are being made. And that's the <laughs> Thank you both and welcome. And don't feel, don't be shy. If you need to go cheer on, please go ahead. We are, uh, we're going to move on. This is probably the best part of the meeting today. So now we're going to move into our own learning. Uh, and I'm going to give that to Suzanne and Stephen. Uh, we're going to do budget learning, which is part of our onboarding of our new board members and remembering as all board members. So there's no, we're always learning. So while they get the, are you ready? I'm ready. Ready for Suzanne? Okay. I'm ready. Stephen, are you going to share yours? Yeah, exactly. I am going to share my screen right, right now. There we go. All right. Let me slide so. All right. Well, let's get to page one. All right. All right. So as I um, as I mentioned uh, before the last presentation. Um, that we were um, we were taking some of the things that we had talked about on Monday and we're we're placing them um, within the tr budget training as well. So, um, so the budget process really begins with this training, and uh, and we hope that it gives you a little insight into the processes and general understanding of how we um, develop the budget. Um, some of the complexities of our uh, funding system. Um, we won't go too deep into that in this training, but but that exists as well. Um, and that how these uh, how these begin to look at how they impact uh, property taxes. Um, so if you have been paying attention to letters that are already out there um, for um, communities to start looking at from the governor, from the full Vermont School Boards Association, Superintendents Association, all that. So we're not starting too early, but we are starting earlier than most. And so um, so I just want to, to put that out there. The essential work of the school board is to develop and adopt and 
adopt a budget to support the vision and assure sound financial oversight. And so we have governance standards uh, around that, um, and we follow those uh, governance standards around uh, doing consistent and financially sound processes to manage, use our resources, and ensure transparency of financial operations. And we prepare and present an annual budget which ensures compliance with federal and other budgeting requirements and demonstrates a clear connection to our goals and priorities. And if applicable, the goals and priorities of each member school district. Yeah, well, that was the old SU. I guess I need yeah, to pull that yeah, out. Well, no, it's a, this is because the district governance standards are going to go into effect on July 1st, 2025, and that's the language. We still have some SDs around our yeah. state, so that's why the language is like that. There but you go. We are set up we are in a, a way. Yeah, we're a district, but we're set up in a way that we would easily meet the standard. Yeah. All right, so our goals for tonight is just understand uh, some of the budget design process, including our approach to the, to the budgeting, understand our current budget realities, review configuration budgets, and for the board to set some budget parameters for us to proceed forward with actual drafts. So this first uh, budget that we present to you is just a baseline budget. Um, and from there is where we develop uh, further budget drafts until we come to a decision. And, um, and that decision will come uh, sometime in January um, is usually when we make that decision. So you, you look at the budget development timeline. These are some of the major milestones. So today is our training. Um, some uh, assumptions capital improvement project budget is also going to be in front of you as well. Um, we'll talk, continue to talk about configuration options. We will be looking at draft, budget draft number one in October. Um, and some community engagement with that draft, and then in November, budget draft number two, and number three in December, should we need that with additional community input and presentation. So a very similar process that we've followed in years past, it's just starting a month earlier. When I actually put this slide together from last year's slide, it was October 18th was the date on when we did the budget training. So exactly one month. And so, so we certainly have, um, we have a, a pretty pretty early start, which means there are some assumptions that we make during that time. Our mission statement, to nurture and inspire in all students passion, creativity, and power to contribute to their local and global communities. This has been our mission statement since I first got here, so before me. So I think it's really, it stood the, st the test of time. Just a reminder, our core beliefs again, because this is what guides our, our experiences. These are what we feel as a district and a board and as a community that are important for us. And then the goals of the strategic plan that guide all of our work um, in this day and age. All right. All right. Suzanne, I'm going to let you do this one. <laughs> Uh, for those of you that don't know, oh, yes. Suzanne Dan, the business administrator for the school district. Uh, since this budget is an early estimate, the assumptions used will continue to be refined as we move closer to the date the budget needs to be worn. As you know, the majority of school district expenses are personnel costs. The number of personnel employed by the district is an important factor within the local control. The salaries and wages paid to those employees are bargained by the board through collective bargaining agreements, which are currently in place through June 30th, 2026. The baseline budget incorporates negotiated increases in wage schedules as well as step increases for eligible employees. This budget estimates an increase for health insurance premiums of 15%. This will become more refined once the insurance company notifies us of 25-26 rates but some estimates out there have been as high as 17% increases due to the shortage in hospital staffing across the state and the resulting increases in costs for Vermont hospitals. The municipal retirement system has notified employers of an estimated increase of 0.25% in the contributions paid by employers. That's incorporated in these estimates. Uh, the budget estimates um, the budget estimates the needs for students receiving special education services that include out-of-district placements, transportation, one-to-one, -one, behavioral supports, and other services. This number will also continue to be developed and refined as we move through the budget process. Current contracts for auditors and insurance plus estimates for inflation are included. Transportation based upon current transportation contract. No reduction or increase in routes was incorporated in this baseline budget. We will review potential changes to routes as we prepare the draft number one proposal of the budget. 
The consumer price index for the Northeast region was at a 3.6% change from July 23 to July 24. Using FY24 actual expenditures data, a 3.6% inflationary factor was applied to the non-payroll expense line items in the budget, plus a 5% estimate for the next fiscal year. These amounts will also be reviewed more closely as we move forward in the budget process. Debt service payments updated for the debt service schedule. This budget incorporates a proposed capital fund transfer based upon an amount identified when developing the multi-year capital improvement plan, which, which the board will uh, review, discuss, and affirm an amount tonight. Uh, this budget, the funding includes requests to provide current <coughs> software programs and continue cybersecurity strengthening efforts. And finally, this budget assumes reductions in revenues, including tuition and the use of fund balance in FY25. Right. I would just, as a reminder, we use very rough estimates for the uh, for the tax rates and some of that information. I know I keep saying that, but it's because it's so unknown at this point in time. Um, so we don't want to hold ourselves to any specific numbers, but those numbers get better and better as we go through the process. Um, and so I hope that we see that as well. I also mentioned that we had a reduction in um, some of our grant funds uh, that requires some of our positions to be moved to the general fund as well. That was another assumption that we'd made in part of our budgeting. All right. So. So we've developed two budgets for review tonight. The baseline budget does not make changes to programs or services and maintains the five pre-K to sixth grade schools and one seventh through twelfth grade school. This budget is a 12.48% increase in net education spending. There are some percentages that the board should keep in mind as we proceed through the budget process. The first is how much money needs to be cut to reduce the budget by 1%. That amount is $341,803. The other percentage we have provided for the board consideration is what would a 3% increase in the budget be. This is something that we also provided last year. That amount is $1,025,410 in spending above the current year budget. In order to bring the net education spending down below a 3% increase, or just at 3%, the FY26 budget needs to be reduced by $3,240,745. All right. The excess spending threshold was reinstated by the legislature for the FY26 budget and is calculated at 100% of the statewide average district per pupil net education spending for FY25 plus NEEP inflation. That's the formula. <laughs> the Vermont Agency of Education was kind enough to provide us the number though. Uh, the August 1st, 2024 estimate from them uh, is $16,108.20 per pupil. This means that the actual threshold for the district is dependent on the number of long-term weighted average daily membership which we have currently estimated at 2,355.11. With that number, the district's excess spending threshold for FY26 is $37,936,583. It is probable that this threshold <coughs> will change. This budget exceeds that threshold by $509,917. The penalty for exceeding the excess spending threshold is double taxation of the amount above the per pupil excess spending threshold. So we would be double taxed on the $509,000. This slide provides a visual representation of the breakdown of expenditures between functional areas within the district. As you can see, the largest amounts are in direct instruction and special education with a combined 56% of the total budget. I'll just pause here for a few seconds to give you a chance to review the remaining expense categories. <clears throat> All right, move it on. The second budget prepared for tonight is the three pre-K to fifth grade and one sixth through twelfth grade school model. 
this budget is a 5.49% increase in net education spending and would require us to cut $849,630 to get us down to a 3% increase. This budget is under the estimated excess spending threshold currently using 2,355.11 as the LTW ADM. Again, the threshold is likely to change as the actual LTW ADM are determined by the AOE. So this slide uh, is a reminder that the budgeted expenditures are the amount the district plans to spend, which is the dollar amount that is born and voted on, and that's your top section there, minus uh, and revenues represent the money the district anticipates receiving to offset those expenditures. So expenditures minus your revenues equal your net education spending. The net education spending is the amount that needs to be raised by property taxes and is used to develop the local spending per pupil that the homestead tax rate is based upon. This slide compares expenditures, revenues, and net education spending for both budget models with your bottom line differences. Uh, percent increase at the bottom, 12.48% for the current configuration and a 5.49% increase for the three, three K to fifth and one, six to 12. That's a mouthful, that way. <laughs> All right. So this is the slide that we had provided that has been referenced um, also tonight. Uh, we updated um, this slide to reflect the enrollment numbers based upon uh, this current um, current year. We realize that, uh, that we have not presented these numbers until now in terms of our enrollment, but we also base our enrollment on the October uh, 1st numbers and so we feel like we're pretty confident that this is where we will be in terms of those numbers this slide presents a pretty significant change from what we showed on um, on Monday um, and and we are just trying to make sure that we get this information correct at this point in time so that this is accurate and correct to the number of students that are in our district and that are projected to be in the district next year Stephen, I'm wondering if you want to go over it. So not everybody can see it from there. And, oh, yeah. yeah. So the changes. So the the biggest changes are in, obviously in the in the enrollment numbers there um, for that are projected. Those are the same numbers that we presented earlier for classroom configurations as well. Um, the way that we um, the way that we put together the the numbers and Suzanne, you can you explain how you came up with the like Berlin for five million ninety thousand. Thank you. We track a lot of expenses at the location or the site for Berlin. So uh, the building maintenance is tracked there, the direct instruction, cost of uh, classroom teachers, cost of, uh, cost of art, music, um, preschool is tracked at the building level. What's not tracked at the building level is things that are uh, tracked at the school district level, which would include all of the capital spending, uh, debt service, any centralized services, and the bulk is special education, which is centralized at the, the district level. So to allocate that amount out, which you can see the WCUUSD allocated uh, above by pupil amounts for each version. So those amounts are taken and then redistributed along with the amounts that we do track by building. And so they're, they're distributed by the location based on the number of pupils at those locations. Can I ask, I'm sorry, I'm I, very confused that's about okay. the Dobie numbers. <laughs> Just because the slide we saw earlier tonight said 63, this says 61, and then the slide from Monday said 74. And I just don't understand. So, so we we spent the last two days making sure that our enrollment numbers that we have been projecting were accurate. They were not. We kept saying that we were estimating and doing projections. This is based upon the current number of students who are attending our schools. The difference between that 61 and 63 are students that are um, that are not 
counted in the building because of Act 166. So they're they're somewhere else, not actually in the building. That's true for all the buildings. Any building that has students that are designated. So students are Dodie now. So right now. Dodie's current <laughs> population. If you give me a second, I can look that up for you. Yeah. So I don't have it off the top of my head. I'm sorry. And so this is this fiscal year 26 is projected for next year if it were what grades? Yeah. So current grades or the top one is the current configuration. So K through six. K pre K through six. And the bottom one is the three elementary school model. Right, so both. So if you pre K through five. Next year, Dodie would have 61 students. Correct. Next year. There, are, there are three kindergartners at Dodie, that are enrolled at Dodie right now, and only a few uh, pre K. So that 74 was just an error. That was a projection that. There's no I'm sorry, but, there, but that, are, that are Worcester pre K students. Right. So right now there are 69 at Doty, but there are, are five kindergartners. And there are, sorry, there are 74 and eight of those are pre-K, which are at Romney. But we record them by town for this census data, so. And the census data is what's used for these numbers. The numbers, I'm not sure, Stephen, from the, the stuff on Monday, was that the NESDEC numbers that we were using? The, the projections were, we were trying to use the projections. And, and it actually underrepresented East Montpelier um, in the number of students that were there. And it overrepresented um, a couple of us, Doty and Middle, uh, and Rumney as well. Both had some slight changes. Yeah, and I think that Alicia pointed that out from uh, right. East Montpelier. Know, there were some questions around the East Montpelier numbers, so we took a deeper dive and looked really close at today's census numbers of where everybody is, and that's where we came up with these revised numbers. So there are 66 students at Dodie this year. Being educated in the building? Is that what you're talking about? Yes. Yes, I don't know how else you would define how to do that. Well, okay. well, <laughs> well, 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 we do a census <laughs> by the town, and so I'm looking at 74 for the town, and but there are eight that are currently being educated at Romney's building in preschool. Okay, so the 61 is in the town, most of not in Dope. Um, correct. Okay. Yep, on this budget by building, this number is Worcester's number, yep. Even though there are 74 this year, next year there will be 61. Correct. Correct. Because there are that many sixth graders going to U32 next year? There are 13 sixth graders from Doty going to U32 next year. And thank you. Yeah. All right. So I, I know, I, I, I recognize the, the difficulty in this. What you're about it is it just it makes it's, it it's a significant it's a change. It's a number. It's right. a change. So I just want to make sure I understand right. the correct number. This, this is the most correct number. Okay. This was what we spent the last two days making sure Perfect. that any projections that we've made, we've correct, you know, we've we've actually gone back and corrected. We've we talked with the principals to make sure that we understood. Like we really wanted to make sure we know that this is the important numbers, and so we just want to make sure that we had those correct. And this is as correct as we can be at this moment. We'll have some time for questions at the end. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, all right. Uh, long term weighted average, average daily membership is the two year average of daily membership plus state place students, plus applicable weights for different grade levels, poverty, sparsity, population density, small schools, and students receiving uh, English language learner services. Uh, we previously knew this as equalized pupils. It still is equalized pupils. It's just the, the calculation and the weighting changed uh, following a UVM study. And then the AOE changed the name to LTW ADM. Uh, it determines the equalized tax rate. The official long-term weighted average daily membership is calculated by the AOE and should be available in November. 
This calculation uses an estimate for long-term weighted average daily membership that estimates the factors for poverty, ELL, and sparsity using prior year amounts. Uh, this number, I'm going to quantify this, like if Steven's saying numbers are rough, this is the, the calculation that I'm the least confident in right now and believe it could decrease even more, which would then increase our, our cost per pupil, which then increases our tax rate. So using the current configuration baseline, the local spending per pupil is a 13.53% increase, which is an increase over FY25 from $14,380 per pupil to $16,325 per pupil. The local spending per pupil increases 6.46% from $14,380 in FY25 to $15,309 in the budget for the three, K, three pre-K to fifth grade schools and the 1, 7 through 12. Six, six through 12. Six through 12, yep. I told you it was a mouthful. <laughs> Can I clarify something? When you are talking about, you said that you're, you're not confident in this particular number, is that the number of LTW ADM or is that the cost per LTW ADM? The LTW ADM is the thing I'm the least confident in. And a big part of that is knowing all of those weighting factors that go into it. How many students are we counting on FRL right now? Don't have a solid number for that. I don't have a solid number for the density. I don't have a solid number for students on ELL. There's just so many factors that go into it. And what you're seeing tonight, the enrollment data is not finalized. It's based on our October 1 enrollment. They're just not as firm as I would like. And so that's why you saw me pushing back a little earlier in the budget conversations and saying, I really don't want to give you the tax rate projections. Is there <laughs> but here they are, as requested. Where are those uh, numbers that you're kind of waiting on? Where do they come from? Who generates those? Do we internally or does the AOE? We provide them to the AOE. The AOE audit sends it back to us. We look at what the AOE has said they've gotten to see if it matches what we told them in the first place. There's just some back and forth that happens uh, and some review. Yeah. Is there a time frame when you think you'll have more? No, but we're going to get it. Yeah. Thank you. All right. All right, I'm going to keep moving us through some of the tax pieces here. So let's take a look at some of the reasons we've indicated that the tax rate projections shared tonight are some rough <coughs> estimates. Uh, the calculation is based on an estimated long-term weighted average daily membership. That's what I was just going to talk you about. The estimated equalized homestead tax rate for this budget was calculated using the FY25 property yield, which was $9,893. That will change. This results in an equalized homestead tax rate of 1.6501. This number divided by the common level of appraisal results in the estimated property tax rates for each town, illustrated by this table. The 13.52 percentage increases are the same across the board because this estimate does not change the CLAs from FY25 at all. Notice the correlation between the tax rate increase and the per pupil spending increase without any changes in CLA. And just as a reminder, the property yield is not set until the very, very end after, usually after we vote. Yeah. So, yeah. so that is the thing that we have the least control over. We have control over our spending, but we don't have control over that, nor do we have control over the CLA. So Stephen stole my last bullet. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Most of these numbers become available at the end of December. With the exception of the yield, we'll have an estimated yield in December. But like he said, it's actually set by the legislature. Last year, I think the legislature set it in June. Mm -hmm. And changed it drastically in June, <laughs> if you recall. Mm -hmm. All right, and so here's the... The second budget model results in an equalized uh, rate of 1.5475 using the same assumptions as the first model. This number divided by the common level of appraisal results in the estimated property tax rates for each town, illustrated by this table. Again, the percentage of uh, increases, 6.46%, are the same across the board because the estimate does not change the CLAs from FY25. Uh, and there is a correlation with the increase in the cost per pupil. 
and really the driver before the CLA is applied is the cost per people. Sorry, Michaela, go ahead. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Um, what do these translate into, like, in real money? <laughs> Like per 100,000. I, I will gladly give you that when these are firmer numbers. Mm -hmm. I have and not calculated that. Like, I, I haven't calculated that. I mean, that's what I've been asking for for like ever. It's just like, I mean, the Worcester group came up with $33. I don't know. Like, it's I'm not a matter of not being day. able to do it, Michaela. It's, it's a matter of not feeling like these are solid numbers to give you, and that's, I just think it's a little bit irresponsible to be quoting tax rates when I think there's so many mm -hmm. variables that are not solid. I think it's irresponsible to vote on options where we don't actually have enough numbers. Okay. Where's that? I think that it's important to remember that the only thing we can control is the spending that we do in our district. Mm -hmm. And so these numbers show what would happen regardless of like CLA changes and things like that. But to Suzanne's point, every single number used in this calculation is an estimate, which leads to compounding estimates. So whatever number we put out there could be highly inflammatory and, and incredibly not true. Yeah. So I think it could cause damage either way. I think it's important to know if there's going to be a meaningful financial impact one way or the other. Just comparing the two or three options. That's all. Okay. I'm not okay. telling you anything. It's actually make a real comparison. Okay. That people understand. And not just say, this is going to save this. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 And, and I think what, one thing that I want us to remember is that we are using this projected numbers right now as a budget training, and then we'll get into that conversation. Okay, so let's let them finish their budget training so that we yep, understand how there. it works. Okay, no, it's okay. And then we'll get into the details it's a, it, of uh, so let's let's, fresh let's, learning. One of the hardest things in, that I found when I moved to this state was <laughs> the, how to understand the funding formula for schools. It is a very complex process. So some of the things that we would like to just um, ask of you is that as you think about your guidelines, in the past, the spending threshold has been a guideline uh, for us. Um, we, we, can, we are obviously considering configuration changes. Um, we're trying to frame our budget decision around meeting goals of our strategic plan. And, um, and we're, we still have those goals of supporting accelerated growth for students from historically marginalized identities and, um, and continuing to develop our multi-layer system of supports. These are, these are guiding principles for us, really, but these aren't necessarily hard, fast numbers that we can work towards. And I know that this is always the, in my, in my entire time here in this district and watching Vermont, this is the hard spot, right? Is how do we set some, you know, thresholds and some standards and priorities for us? And so I just, I, I appreciate the board's um, deliberation and really appreciate how difficult this situation is to, to talk through. So. Okay. So uh, that was our budget learning. Uh, and then uh, we have a little bit more on budget learning. There's some people on the board. Oh, look at that. I can speak with. I'm so excited. You can hear me. Uh, there's some people on the board that already have this book and some people on the board that don't have this book. Uh, we are hoping to do a little more learning. I'm going to try to remember the people that I know. Can you give one to Elizabeth? to Julia, and then everybody else on that side should have one, and Julia, I believe Julia. Zach doesn't have one, and uh, yeah, Michelle doesn't have one. I have one. Yeah. I was just helping. Celia doesn't have one. Okay. I wonder if you have one. Okay. So we're not going to do this tonight. That you have read Vernon's. Yeah. Were we supposed to have read the first five no, no, chapters no, 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 already? No. So I'm just <laughs> handing it out today. You have yours. Not with you. What? Not with you. Yeah, and I, I, was, not, I was not expecting anybody to have it. Like, with here's them, your book. But we're going to read the first five. <laughs> As we're going all through this, you know, difficult conversation, it's a good, it's, it's, it's a good book for you guys to reflect on. We are going to get into more board learning together and review mm -hmm. uh, the book, Julia and McKellen. <laughs> So, 
I will just say that for now. I'm not going to get into the details because we have a lot of work uh, to do, but uh, take a look and we'll discuss how to discuss the book at a uh, another meeting. We usually use our first meeting of the month to do a little more learning, which is why we're learning. You know, we are just as good as we all you know, put the work and learn to work together and know what our jobs are to you know, serve our communities. So uh, with that, we're going to move into approving our budget development timeline and our priorities. And then we're going to move into budget parameters and everything that we look at right now is going to impact those conversations. So don't feel like you're not going to be able to talk about that presentation. That presentation is going to inform our next conversations. So uh, let's look at our approve our budget development timeline and priorities on page four. Oh, let me turn the mic, sorry. Somebody else. Okay. Is that better? Page 17 is where the timeline is. Thank you. Oh, okay. The draft timeline starts on page 4. No. 17. Oh, 17. Oh, because I have the one online. Okay. Never mind. Oh, no. There's so I'm looking for a motion to approve. Ursula? I move that we approve the budget development timeline. Okay. And I have a second, second by SAC. And now discussion. Is there any changes to that budget timeline? The recommendation of the finance committee was to approve it at our last meeting, but it, hopefully you guys had a chance to review it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's on page 17 in the packet. Any comments? Mm -hmm. It looks like some people need time to review it, haven't had a chance to see it, so I'm going to give you another two minutes. Can I ask a question? Yes, of course, Elizabeth. So, um, in September, the month we're in, um, it talks about budget meetings with principals and early discussion with individual buildings on any new or reduced services and staffing requests. So my assumption would be that there would be two conversations happening. The a configuration conversation budget and the general budget that, the baseline budget that we're talking about. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Have those happened already? Tomorrow. Any other questions for members? <coughs> okay, I'm not trying to rush you, but please speak up if you have any questions. Otherwise, I'm looking. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, the motion carries, and we have a budget development timeline and priorities. Thank you. Uh, now let's move into the budget uh, parameters. The document that we included in the in the in the packet is is just the start. The conversation is not by any means the end of the conversation. So in this document, if you go into number one. And it's page 21 in the packet. And everybody there? Yeah. Okay. So one of the things that we talked about, and we talked about this at our finance committee, and I did my best to include the feedback that I got from our finance committee. But please, finance committee, speak up if I forgot something. But we will continue to offer and further develop the multi-layer system of supports to all students across all of schools and professional development for our teachers. Page 22. Page 22. Oh, page 22. Okay, page 22. Yeah, I, I skipped the part of the equity because we, you know, like we've talked about that. You know, I want you to reflect on our equity policy. We've been talking about what equity means. I'm jumping right because of the hour. I'm jumping right into the budget parameters so that we can keep in mind what we've been talking about 
then concentrated services we should include. So what we talked a lot about our last meeting as the finance committee and also as the configuration committee is that how do we tie the parts of our budget to service delivery to students, including how admin positions support the success of our students? Because there's always been a question about that. So we were trying to be specific at putting that there. Am I not? No, you're fine. Okay. I'm just going to try and yeah. speak. And then uh, frame the budget to the goals of our strategic plan and link the strategic plan there and our core beliefs, because that's something that we want to do. Uh, consider for configurations changes that support our criteria table, because that's how we were moving ahead with models for study. And then continue to frame budget decisions around ed quality standards, equitable distribution of resources, and meeting student need. Those were the three pillars that we used to use and they have now been a part of the um, strategic plan but we felt that it was important to put them more to be more specific. Uh, low is increasing net spending uh, EQS and addressing equitable distribution of resources and students that is already part of the criteria table but it's something that has come up so as a board we can decide to leave that there or just leave it on the criteria table. Uh, Consider configuration changes that realize program quality improvements within optimal class sizes. That again is something that we've talked at our um, quality committee, but it's also part of our criteria table, so we can decide if we uh, leave it or just leave it at that criteria table. It's something that comes up from the community, it comes up from, uh, from us. Uh, and long-term sustainability of our system is what we're hoping to do with the criteria table too but um, here we are. So that's what we discussed in Finance Committee. If I forgot something, please yeah, speak up. And I know also from the memo that we have from, from Stephen and, and, and Suzanne, they want us to be more specific. What I want us to do is to stay on our role too, to stay up in the balcony and not get down in the trenches. So if you have... Uh, you know, I, I know that they're looking for specifics, uh, um, forgetting exactly how they phrased it, but they're looking for specifics on why we'll make the board not vote on a specific budget, right? Yeah. But Can, you want me to speak to Yeah, and I, I want to save you of one that, you know, I, our reputation is, well, you go. <laughs> I will just say that what will help us um, in our budget development process will, if the board can, as a as a board, be as specific as they can around what are the things that um, that the board wants within that budget, right? So, um, and and I, I want to be very careful about how I say that. That's you as a whole, as to what you as a board really um, want to make sure that we put the things into the budget that you as a whole want, and that you as a whole we want to make sure that if there are things that you don't want that we don't put those in the budget. Um, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out on the limb just a little bit to say, I know that individuals may have individual concerns, but this is for the administration, is what's the will of the board, is what we're really seeking in that. And I know that may be difficult, I mean, I, but I just will tell you, that makes it easier for us as an administrative team to, to bring you a budget that meets your requirements. Yeah, and, and looking at this, there was one thing that is missing here, just um, yeah, and I might have sent the wrong version to, to Melissa, but I don't see that under our threshold. Oh. oh I, it was in there, but so. Yeah. Can, it's, so that's a it given, should, isn't it? It's, it's a given, but it should be part of our, in, mm -hmm. and, and it was there. I'm just going to look at the actual document. But go ahead, please ask questions. So, so again, because I, I know that I don't want LT feeling frustrated that we're, we are asking a question. And so what my wondering is, is the references, um, so I wonder if there's a tiered approach that leadership team will take because one, if you come back with a configuration budget, but then we as a board go a different path, and I'm not saying we are either way, but if you all spend a lot of time at the next budget coming to us with some different configuration um, assumptions, that could be very frustrating to you. So I don't know if there's a tiered approach to it or if what or if we can define those parameters better for you. Um, I just know that that was the feedback we got, that we kept making it too movable. Yeah. 
Go ahead, Chris. So um, the difficulty I have with these parameters is that they're just broad and they're ill. They're not defined by anything. They're not defined by anything in the budget. I mean, the budget's broad and vague. Um, so if we could get some criteria from the budget as it exists now, that what parts of it support each of these parameters and how, that would be very helpful because then we then we know more specifics about what we're what is being supported through these parameters and okay. what isn't being supported through these parameters in the budget. Okay. Um, the other thing in terms of um, uh, individuals having different things that they might want to interact, I, I would say anyone who has a suggestion like that, we bring it up, have a discussion as a board and vote. Because then the majority vote would then say that's that's the will of the board. As opposed to you know, what's the will of the board? It's, not, it's, it, it's defined no, by individual areas of interest um, or, or you, discussion. You, yeah, I, I would just say, yes, you described the process that I would appreciate. You're hoping. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes, that, that the earlier the better on some of that. Yeah. And, and I realize that we're also early in the process as well. The, right. the more information needs to come out from us and, and we'll have that back and forth. But yes, exactly what you said is what will be helpful for us as we develop a, a budget to bring to you that's a final budget. Okay. Okay. So with, with that, Chris, I think what, what they're trying to say between you know, hints is that for the past two years, we haven't really stand by our parameters, right? So they're asking us to be more specific. So what I would suggest is like, for example, in number one, continue to offer the further development of the multi-layer system of supports to all students across our schools and for professional development for teachers. That is for us a strategic investment. Sorry, I'm like talking with my hands hitting that mic. Strategic investment in building teachers' capacity is what we know that works. And not, we know because we have feedback from quality and we're all learning that. And it, that helps with our most vulnerable students we'll, that will meet their needs, right? We know that poverty is not a disability, right? If anything, we need our best teachers with all our students. So there are different places where they can show us that, but we also have to believe in that parameter. Do we believe in that parameter? Have we seen in our data from from Jen and Ursula and, and Julia when we have just looked at data that that's something that works? Investing in our, I, I'm just asking, just like, are we, are we solid on that? Isn't that a parameter that works? If we have all our teachers being able to meet at least 80% of our student needs, investing on our multi-layer supports. Isn't that something that we can all agree on? Yeah, but that's yes, a little, but that's more specific too. You just use the number that says, yeah, that's a goal, as opposed to this broad-based, and, and, and you know, having the board know how this, these parameters are being implemented in, through the budget process, would be very, and that's where we get into the specifics of this is what our parameter is, this is how we meet it uh, through this allocation of resources to these individuals or these programs. We don't get that. Uh, we don't, the, the budget that we have here is just really broad um, and, and just goes to person. It really doesn't break down into detail um, that we can see what programs are being offered to address what, what needs. And I think that would be helpful for us as a board and, and the community actually to see rather than these broad strokes, you have some, you know, some narrower strokes and you get a more clear picture of how these parameters are actually being met. Because we actually don't know. I, I would say for the, okay, for so the we can, greatest part, so we don't we know. So when yeah. they come, when they come back, they can yeah. speak more about how this parameter is being met. But it's something that we all thumbs up, believe, Elizabeth. Yeah. Um, I, as I look at this and I think about these different parameters, for me, the the broad piece of it that that I will need more information on is is how are we as a board defining equitable distribution of resources? How are we as a board um, uh, deciding or concentrating on the services that we should include? I know that the administrators will come to us and say, these are the things that we see create a high quality educational opportunity for, for children. But I do think that there are some, some terms in here that will probably warrant a, a conversation before we can have that more succinct conversation about making those dis budgetary decisions. Meaning, I think that there's a, there's a lot of broadness here 
and I think that being able to narrow it down a little bit more, just like you did with number one, mm -hmm. and kind of breaking down what does that mean and what does that look like, kind of to Chris's point, what does it look like in practice and how do we, how does, how do we meet those various parameters would be very, very helpful. Yeah, so what I'm hearing is that we're seeking to understand those parameters, yeah, not, necessarily, not necessarily that we're disagreeing. So can we go right. one by one? Sure. So let's, let's move to two, and Michaela, you're doing your face, so what am I missing? <laughs> what am I missing? It's okay. I just think these are all too broad to be at all helpful <laughs> in this process. So that's what I we're getting at. So subjective and broad, and I can't imagine this is helpful to the leadership team. Because I, actually, the we all believe these things, but then, but then, the discussion is helping. Yeah. Like I'm starting to, I'm, I'm starting to think of because I've been, I've been here through. Yeah. This will be my 11th budget with the district in various forms, um, and just to, trying to understand what's the, um, how do we, how do we show you the budget that we're putting together so that you know that we're meeting these things is a really that's a good question, mm -hmm. right? And I and I, I'm not sure yet. I, I don't have I have some wonderful people that are over there in the audience who are going to help me kind of figure out, are there some things that we can do when we meet with the principals tomorrow and, and really talk about this more specifically? We'll look at these things and say, you know, are we meeting these? And if so, like, what are we doing? How are we spending the money to be able to meet these yeah. obligations? And I just don't, I also don't want to over promise to, uh, like, uh, we're early in the budgeting process, which helps us, but I also want to be just careful of not saying, because I, I, I can, I'm sure you're the same team that I just relied upon are all sitting there going, what is he going to make us do? Um, and so, uh, so I just want to be careful about, uh, you know, the, the clearer that you can be about what will help you make a decision, the, the, the easier it will be for me to bring you information for that. And I, and I think we've, we've illustrated, we've kind of been trying to find the right information on configuration. Right? What information do we need? And we keep reiterating and, and iterating all of that information and hopefully it gets better and better each time. That's the goal. Mm -hmm. So, so like in number two, oh, Diane. So it, you know, we now have a threshold. We haven't had a threshold for a few years. So we now, I think we can all safely say we want to be a, you know, at the threshold or under. I think that is a definite parameter that we can say is a clear number that goes out to leadership team and that. Now underneath that, because you're right, I, I mean, we have been told repeatedly we are not to get into the minutia of what some of these mean. Um, and so therefore, if we put those broad headings out there, I don't know how that can be helpful for specifics. But what might be a helpful one is this is the threshold under this threshold, as a leadership team, you've identified, regardless of you EQS, and that's a guy, what does the leadership team know that they need to have in place in order to continue to do the MTSS work, to, do mm -hmm. the, uh, to meet the other parameters? And so, to me, it, it's very succinct that we're relying on LT to tell us what is the staffing you need, what is the uh, PD you need, the uh, supports and curriculum and all of those materials that are needed in order to address those goals, yeah. but staying under that, per that threshold. Yeah. yeah, so we'll, can, Chris? I'm just waiting, I'm just waiting my turn. Okay, yeah, I just wanted to go, to go, because there's some people that haven't had no, a chance no, to are, speak. That's fine, I'm just waiting okay. my turn. So Daniel? Yeah, I was going to say something similar to what Diane said. I think, um, to me, like everything flows from our directive around a number, and the only number suggested so far, which I agree with, is at a minimum, get under the excess split spending threshold. I think parameters one, two, three, and five are all, like, based on what is suggested that we cut. Like one, two, three, and five all need to be addressed. So if a, if a cut is proposed, we need to understand that cut in the context of multi-layer systems of support. We need to understand that cut in the context of how, while it might not indirectly support the success of our student, it might only indirectly support the success, we need to understand how, mm -hmm. and how success of our students is affected. Similarly, like, how does it, how does it reflect back to the goals of the strategic plan and the core beliefs and then high quality standards, equitable distribution of resources and students? Those are all, I think, ways in which we need to examine any proposed cuts. 
That's, mm -hmm. that's great. So if we go on uh, number two, well, you had a question, and then we can move to number two. Um, to so Ursula? Oh, sorry, Ursula. Sorry. Oh, let Chris go. No, let go, Chris. No, sorry. Chris had his hand up way before I did. Okay. So um, to follow up on Diane's suggestion, the why and how of what you're going to tell us would be really helpful, too. It's mm -hmm. not just what, but why and how mm -hmm. to meet those goals uh, in, in Florida. I hate the balcony. It's too cold up in the balcony. I want to be down in the arena. And I think we have more, we can have more impact and be in the arena that, you know, not we're, we're interfering, not interfering, but be getting a, a better view. We're, because we're we don't right. have binoculars. The balcony is way far away. We, no, I know that, no. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. Okay. I'm going to go into that. First of So I've heard people saying that they want within these guidelines, because now we have a threshold limit again, um, they want leadership team to give us their recommended budget and explain why they think it's important to have those pieces in the budget for us to understand that. And I'm curious how they could do that differently than they have in the last two years. Well. I mean, you're looking at me, so I'm looking no, at I, There are <laughs> yeah, no, 10 no, people that, sitting over there. So it, I'm not yeah. looking at you. Um, and, and I didn't mean it, I just meant that being to me, that compels me to, you know, to say what I would um, say, which is, you're absolutely right. That is the information we have been given. The information that we're given, my understanding is as a board, it's a dialogue. And so yes, we may shift what our question is or what we're saying we need for additional information. It doesn't mean we're being disrespectful and discounting. I don't know what questions to ask until I have some of that information um, brought to me. I'm gonna, um, is that did you have your hand up? Yeah. Go ahead. Um, and then yeah, just say, <clears throat> I think kind of like Dan, I sort of struggle with you know, having a number on. I'm, I'm uncomfortable with sort of defaulting to the excess threat, th spending threshold just being the number we have. I mean, just I mean, acknowledging that this stuff is all really rough. It's looking like that. That would put us over a 10% increase. So that's doubling the budget every seven years. Um, I don't think that's sustainable. Um, I think it was, I don't know, the thing I struggled with last year was not knowing, you're just putting a number on, you know, am I asking for to, to take a few layers of skin off a lesion or am I asking you to amputate a leg? Yeah. <laughs> and I think understanding that is, is the trouble. I, I did think that in the, when we went to the, you know, when we went to the, our second budget last year, getting the, the options of what did, it, what did it mean to have like a 6%, 8%, 10% mm -hmm. increase mm -hmm. was really helpful. I don't know, I realize in that circumstance there was a, we had to do it. There was a, there was gonna, it was gonna cause stress. I don't know what the trade off is in terms of stress on staff putting those different options out there. But from, our, from my perspective, in terms of being able to make those trade-offs and understand those trade-offs and not just throw out a number and not know how serious the consequence was going to be, mm -hmm. I found that really helpful. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. So, Zach, uh, just a question back to you. Should we add a number nine? Well, I added number nine because actually number five should have been under the excess spending. And I'm sorry I shared the whole <laughs> document. But the long-term sustainability of our system, should we, in that one, add... The percentages. So, say we want to see a three uh, percent. Should it be based on regional percentage, like regional inflation? We tried the real inflation last year, and we took it out right away okay. after. So, I'm a little hesitant to do that. So, we're saying that the, I'm looking at all of you because I'm not like this is my least favorite part of the, you know, guess estimating percentages. So, I'm trying to zero down in people like the, you know, like people that do numbers all the time. So. Michelle's got 10%. Did, did Amelia, did you? Amelia, go ahead. And then we go. Yeah. Well, I, I did just want to provide um, feedback that I think that when we, when you answer this and you sort of collaborate and, and respond to that, I think it'll be helpful for the community and for everybody who's voting. Can you move the mic closer when you speak? Because not everybody could hear you. Okay. Uh, Michelle, um, I use the mic. <laughs> what, did, what did she say? Yeah, we didn't hear what she said. Oh, you didn't hear what she said. It was just. Bring it closer. 
I can discuss it. But I just wanted to say I'm appreciating this conversation because I think that um, it'll be really helpful when it comes to voting time for everybody, for the community to see the breakdown and the correlation. Um, and even if we stick with these broad parameters and then in a chart there's sort of like detailed description of um, how we're meeting that and what the connectedness is of even like our budget process last year. I think it would be really helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Michelle. So, I was going to say, I agree with Zach on having um, that document was really helpful. I think as to the board seeing this is a 10%, this is right. I think we need to do that. I think our taxpayers can't keep going up at the rate we've been going. They, I mean, I think we've heard that from them already. That's why we're, we've talked about reconfiguration. So I think if we give the, the leadership team, like, okay, can you bring back three scenarios? These are them. This is what those scenarios entail. Right, because what they did last year, they have one percent, they have one percentage in one column, and so we knew when it went down, it was the things in this column plus these other things, and all the way down to the end. And I feel like that was probably the most helpful when it came time for dealing with the budget. Steven. So um, I'm going to step out on a limb very quickly um, in my tenure here. <laughs> What was difficult about that from the leadership team perspective, though, is that we created that with a gradation of like these, the, the first percentage cuts were, um, were required some hurt. The second, there were levels, right? And the board came back and said, we want to pick and choose from those things, which creates, so the scenario wasn't created for us that you, we would pick and choose because it was labeled out that we wanted to be able to say, okay, if we get through this set of cuts, then that can get us to this point and, and maintain this level of service. That next set of cuts changed to the level of service. So when we cut something from a lower level of service, that created other issues within the way we were thinking of structuring that. I might be able to explain that differently given some of the questions you have, but I just also want to say to the board, like if you ask us for multiple levels of cuts, we would be bringing it to you as levels of cuts and and we would have to have a pretty serious discussion about why we would pull something from a, a, a deeper cut and pull it into a, a, a higher level because that was what we were trying to do is what will hurt the least what will hurt the most were those cuts and those ends and so I just I that's that's my limb that I'm gonna step out I'm gonna step back from it um, but just know that that's that's a difficult position to put us in because we do feel like it was presenting a op menu of options and that wasn't really what we were trying to do when we developed it. We might could come up with some better, because of the language you've said here, we could probably come up with better explanations around those levels that would help you in that decision, I, I think. We hadn't done that process that way before, so it was just tough. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And, and that makes Quiet. sense. So if we go to number, I took that note uh, for number nine, but if we go to number two, uh, concentrate the services we should, in concentrate on the services that we should include, tie the parts of our budget to service delivery to students, including how and main physicians support the success of our students. They can, that's one thing that comes to mind all the time uh, that people want in specifics is that yes or no? Natasha, I'm looking at you because you're doing that. I, can't, I sort of know my board members now, and it's like, mm -hmm. you know, like I can feel you. The question I'm going to ask to you is, is like, how can we better write that number two so that it mean something for our board or how, what are you thinking okay so here's what i'm thinking i'm going to preface this by saying i am not anti-administration even though apparently that's how my comments last year were construed so i just want to put that out there um, what i'm questioning is is money spent on administrative positions the best way to use that money when that money could go to positions with people who are spending more direct time with our students. Um, and so for me, having, including how admin position support is kind of putting out there, well, the expectation is <laughs> admin aren't gonna be touched. Like we're gonna find ways to, to make our budget smaller, but, but admin, like we need to, and I, I'm not saying that that's the intent of it, that's how I'm reading it based on the conversation from last year. Also, when I look at the current staffing, 
And I think about the fact that three of our elementary schools are operating with less than a full-time principal, but the U32 school is operating with only one less administrator than the entire district. I just have questions, and and that's why and that's why we're writing so, it like this so that we can so that we can tie it right because all admin you know like I I've been doing this for a while you know and I and I feel like sometimes there's a misunderstanding of how for example you know Melissa for example impacts all students right or how our you, we ha we tend to detach ourselves from central office so what we're trying to do with this with this. Uh, a parameter is to try to tie that, try to try to tie that how all or like really I, I really believe all of the administrators we don't have all of that information. So how do we make that more clear for our board members and for the public so that we know that we're tying we, we said uh, in I, I believe uh, Jen and Julia did a pretty good job about explaining to us what what are the essentials or what do we need, right? So how are we gonna tie all our students are ministers, and at the same time, we have to give trust, just like they're giving us trust, that the information, you know, like, so if we're already, like, oh, I don't know, whatever they bring to us, I'm, you know, they're going to do the best job they can to try to answer that question. We're seeking to understand as a board how this delivery. I understand that. Okay. And when I brought this up last year, I was met with all kinds of pushback about how dare I even think about looking at cutting admin positions. So I am saying if we have if we are able to give feedback about these parameters, I have a concern that admins specifically are listed under this parameter. Especially and I'll give the same example I gave last year, when I attended this school which had two hundred more students than it has now, we had two admin. Yeah, and and then I, and it ran. Yeah, okay. yeah it took it. it, it <laughs> and it, our it, central it, office is run with without certain positions. I'm not saying it was the best way to run it. I'm not saying that, but I have a concern that if we are specifically putting ad, and and that concern also goes to the letter that Governor Scott put out, and it goes to the guidance that VSBA put out, where they specifically were like, and you shouldn't be cutting admin positions. So I'm putting that concern on the table. I don't like how this parameter is written. I think so, having admin in there is setting a certain expectation. So what I what I could offer, and sorry to be talking so much, what I what I could offer is that the purpose of this uh, number two, it was actually to address what you're talking what you're talking about. So that's the reason to single out administrators is because that's what we kept hurting for the board. Administrators are not being cut. So that was why this parameter came. So if we want to have it broader, we could do it broader. Ursula and then Patrick. Um, Sorry. So I'm going to have two comments. The, the administration cuts were brought up not just within board conversations, but we heard it a lot in the public in regards to um, the reconfigurations discussions. And it was a very loud part. And so I think this perimeter is trying to answer that. I'm wondering if we changed admin to all positions support so that we're concentrating also on how our special educators are reaching our students and how our classroom teachers and our principals and nursing and like literally everybody that's out there in our district that we employ, how are they providing the services that we need and how do they tie into our budget and how are we using our money in a fiscally responsible way. So yeah, admin to all. Patrick and then Seth. My suggestion is uh, similar, but. So my suggestion is similar, um, but it just is to make that comma a period and just scratch the last sentence. So tie other parts of the budget uh, to services, service delivery to students, full stop. Full stop, okay. Mm -hmm. No, that's good. No, I'm, I think it's great. Yeah. I, All right. I, I, I think that much. I just wanted to elaborate a little bit on the thinking behind behind this parameter. I was, yes. I was thinking about it in terms of like how do we, <coughs> how do we both explain it, but also how do we enable the board to make better decisions. So like if you're thinking about, you know, say, payroll, rather than saying, well, there's a payroll person. Of course, you've got to have a payroll person. It's, well, you have to get everyone paid. Then you can think about, well, do we need to have a person? Can we team up with another school district? You know, you know, can it be done jointly? Do we outs outsource to a private company? Sort of all those options open up. And I think that that, 
what I think both make it easier to explain, but I think would also make it easier for the board to think critically about what do we really need here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're going to leave number Daniel two. Daniel. Uh, okay, Daniel. Sorry, I was just going to say I, I agree with Patrick's suggestion, and I also think this discussion is really important and critical for administration to remember as they're developing this, and I think this guidance. The guidance is all, of the of the conversation is almost more important than the list of the parameters, mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot about you know reading this in a vacuum. What Patrick suggest, suggested is sort of a toothless, vague thing, but with the context of the conversation, it's it's exactly what we're trying to direct them to do. And I think about these choices at the margins that the administration has to make if they're proposing cuts. Implicit in those cuts are things that they're preserving also. So we're not asking every single part of the budget be directly tied to parts, you know, or to service delivery to students, but it really is the, the work at the margins that we want to understand. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's important to have explained to us when we see a, a first draft. Thank you, Daniel. So if we move to number three, is frame the budget uh, to the goals of our strategic plan and our core beliefs. Can we all agree on that? What we yeah, value so is what I mean, we fund. Yes, but this seems like something we shouldn't have to even say, right? I mean, shouldn't all our work be framed in that? Yeah, but so that is our umbrella, right? So we should be, mm -hmm. we, you know, like not everybody knows what our core beliefs are, right? So they're linked there, not all every member of the community, and it's, you know, it's what we uphold and and fund is what we value, right? Okay, uh, um, Mr. The, Chris. Um, Stephen, would the, the leadership team be able to, uh, using number three, say, these are the core things that we can absolutely, these are the core things that we absolutely need and cannot do without. Because um, we are looking at a tough budget year again, and if everything's a core belief, if everything's a, a, a need, we won't get anywhere. But if you, it, can you folks come back and say, these are the things that we absolutely need in order to um, provide our, our students with you know, basics, um, but what they will need to progress to. And that's, I know, you know, yeah. I'm being as vague as I can, as yeah. was critical of yeah. before, but do you know what I mean? Yes, we will tie the budget to our core needs. <laughs> yeah, well, but, I mean, yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah. say core needs, but we 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 have very expansive core needs, right. I think. Um, but in terms of just sure, yeah, I, I mean, that would be helpful in terms of a we kind of a minimum threshold that we're looking at. Yeah, thank you. Okay. We'll do our best. Thank you. Okay. okay. Consider configuration changes that support our criteria table. We all approve. Julia, do you have something that you want to share? No. Are you sure? Yeah. Okay. okay. And just please feel, I know that you're new to the board, but please feel free to speak at any Sometimes time. Sometimes my face looks like I'm thinking something that Yeah, and I, I, used so. to say, I, I used to say that I'm to just, my... I'm just <laughs> processing. Okay, okay. I just don't want you to like be upset or not feel no, like you can't talk, I'm just so please, at all times, uh, speak. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. I got distracted now. So consider configuration changes that support our criteria table. The criteria table is something that we all adopted together, so I don't see how we could say no to that, but yeah. trick. But, um, <laughs> but. <laughs> uh, we, we've seen, um, uh, now we've seen the, the, the criteria table in action. I think we, um, we've had some questions about some of the squares and some of the, the, mm -hmm. yeah. um, the um, analysis in there. And so I, I'm not comfortable saying we should use no use number four until um, until we have a criteria table that's that's, um, that's, so, that's but, but but I'm but I'm not looking at the matrix. I'm looking at the criteria table that we actually all approved. The so list of criteria. Link, I, yeah. I, I, we have to believe yeah. on that. We we approved it, right? It's is how the interpretation of that we used in the matrix that is different. How we apply this criteria, I I totally agree with you. We have work to do to make those blue, green, and red that we were trying to do. But as far as the criteria table, we took a lot of input from community. We took a lot of time and care as a board to come up with this criteria table. So the table that I'm looking at is the one that 
You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I voted for it. You voted for it. <laughs> so, so but, I don't, don't want to read. My point is, though, that, that yeah. there's, there's, there's overlap in the squares, and I think if we use them one for one, uh, there it won't be. It's not a it's not a quantitative table, and so I, I, until until we have a version of it that that um, I think is, is is fully flushed out, I'm not comfortable using it to uh, uh, analyze a budget. I think it's a great tool for the conversation we're having around configuration, though. Okay. Which is what we were voted, which is what we voted on for the, which is how, how we considered that table when we voted on it, I believe. Okay. Okay, so should mm -hmm. we, that's scratch number four, is that the will of the board? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm looking at thumbs up or thumbs down. Can we take out number four? So, I'm um, thumbs up. You agree? Yeah, I think oh, it's you? linked to all the core beliefs, so it's probably easier just to stick with the core beliefs. Core beliefs, okay. Yeah. So, just point nine, take it. Thank you. All in, I don't, I don't, I'm not gonna, like, we're gonna vote on it as a whole. I'm just looking at thumbs up. It looks like there's agreement. I'm not seeing any great opposition. Okay, so uh, number five should have been under the excess spending threshold, sixteen thousand one hundred and eight thousand point twenty. So I, that's what I have there. Uh, and then number six is to continue to frame the budget decision read at quality standards and equitable distribution of resources and meeting student need. I feel more of a need to have it now that we're taking the criteria table. Ursula, do you want to say something on that? When we say under the, the threshold limit, are we like at least under the threshold limit, but feel free to go lower? It, I, I'm going to address that one on number oh, okay. nine, and maybe I'll just Sorry. put it together. So I'll get to Seth Sorry, and, I'm jumping. Danny, and Daniel's point. Yeah. So, Michaela and Julia. What would you like to share? Am I missing something? No. You sure? No. Okay. So. Uh, I was just confirming on those Oh, good. I'm just I'm just making sure. I don't. I, I want the conversations at the table. I don't want anybody to feel like they have to have the conversation at the parking lot. I want the conversations here so that we can all share it with the community. So that's my only. Okay. So continue to frame budget decisions around it. So that number six, which in your packet is. Five. Is that okay? Natasha. Just a comment um, around equitable distribution. Yeah. Um, I will only speak for myself, but I know that I heard in several different instances and from several different people that a lot of the budget conversations focused on the high school, the middle high school, and elementary schools were kind of left with what was left over. Um, so I would really hope that during these conversations that when we talk about equitable di distribution that we are giving however many elementary schools we have the exact same consideration that the middle high school gets. Okay. Yeah. The, oops, oops, it's typing for me. That's so weird. Look, okay. It's going great. So... Is, sorry, not that, is there something that I need to add there? What I'm hearing no, from you No, I just want to make sure that that... Okay, so what, what I, like, I would put an example. I was framing as I was trying to do our words for tonight. I, I, you know, I, me, I do like a thousand notes. And I was thinking about, you know, how do we tie, you know, how we have like a common destination for all our students. So uh, one thing that might be helpful for um, our administrators to hear is like, how do we tie that first grader, right? The first grader that we are, how... The education that he's receiving, or the um, uh, interventions, or the layer two supports that the first grader is receiving, how does that tie to what he needs in seventh grade at, at U32? Because I think that sometimes there's that disconnect that we feel that you know, like we're taking out Peter to give to Paul, and and really we're thinking we need to think about we have moved in you know it's been more than 10 years now with those student learning outcomes to thinking about our system as pre-k to 12. so um, um my understanding is that the conversations that happen at the leadership level should be from pre-k to 12. right so how do mm -hmm. we connect those dots might be helpful in that one okay there's the other one after that was lowest increase in net spending with meeting EQS and addressing in equitable distribution of resources and student needs. So in that one is where I was trying to address uh, what you guys were talking about without giving percentages, but should we give percentages? I feel like we should give percentages. Okay, so let's, somebody more intelligent than me, give me the percentages. 
Can I push on? Can I push back on percentages? I think I think that um, that that a that, that the percentages themselves, without without being tied to a, a firm, are gonna are, aren't gonna necessarily mean very much. Like the the threshold is a nice number because it's a number that we can we can say we can't go any higher than that, and that is that is a number that has some logic behind it. But just saying uh, other percentages um, without without logic behind them um, are going to be less meaningful in the in the process. So maybe a, 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 a um, uh, adjectival level, small, medium, large, no cuts, little cuts, big cuts, I don't, I don't know. So uh, would you be comfortable with say, what I was trying to say is lowest increase in net spending meeting with QS. So that means that they can come to, our num to with a number to us without yeah. necessarily being the threshold. Yeah, may I? Yes, yes. You, so you can I, I just want to be sure. Um, I, um, you know, I know in the last two years, one of the things that we, we did set, like, here's the inflation spending and, and hit that mark, and we were in no way capable of doing that, right? So the, the first budgets that administration brought back to you um, as a board in both of those times was higher than the, the, that. So I, I kind of appreciate what you're saying, Patrick, is that let us bring you back the lowest budget that we think that we can do and meet these requirements. And then we can have a conversation then and say, that doesn't look low enough, right? Or that seems okay because we, we may actually have that conversation of this isn't low enough. But if you give the leadership team the opportunity to bring that back, I, and I know this goes against a little bit of my, I need a definite number, but I think that we, we have in the last two years brought you back a budget that, that was lower and was meeting what we thought were the needs of our students. And so if we start from that, I mean, I, and, and meet your requirements around some of these other areas of, of explanation, I think that that could be, I think that could work for us. We, we hear you under the threshold. Um, I think to tie into that conversation and what Michelle was saying earlier with the idea of multiple levels of cuts, which Patrick sort of brought up without tying it to a specific percentage, because we have done that the last two years. We've mm -hmm. given you a specific percentage, and it wasn't even something we could meet. And that makes it hard to have those mm -hmm. conversations. Like, you came to us, which is what we were hoping with a, this is the best we can do, and this is how close we can get it, and this is where we are. Um, I think we maybe need levels because sometimes if you bring us a budget and then we go, can you go lower? You do, and then we go, whoa, that hurt a lot, right? And then it's it, it becomes difficult as well. So I'm wondering if there's a way to do, here's the... I'm sorry, I didn't oh, mean to... I, I didn't know if you were pushing or pointing to a person. Yeah, well, Keely, I just want to make sure she's on it. Keely, raise your hand. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. I got distracted. I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, right. In engineering, we used to call it the do nothing, the Cadillac, and yeah. sort of this in between. Yeah, value engineering. Mm -hmm. The Venti. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we used Cadillac. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. That's okay. That's all I'm saying is Thank like you. maybe bring us some cuts. Like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree that having some levels is helpful, and I think that if you all are able to come back with the lowest increase, then that would be really helpful for decision making. I did the quick math with a check from Suzanne, and I think the threshold is an 11% increase. And so we're actually not dealing with very many options. Um, so I think if you come back with the lowest increase and the threshold, then that gives yeah. us uh, what's the lowest we can do and what's the most we're going to do, and it's, it's not going to be that much in between, to be honest. So, yeah. okay. well. And, and there may be a way to frame it. Last year, we were able to frame it around um, both uh, reductions due to enrollment and program reductions last year. And, and that may be one of the ways that we could frame how do you go to a certain level? How do you go to a level below that? Like, these are program reductions. These are, but these are not, right? These are just meeting the needs of our students as is. And so I think we, we might be able to, to provide yeah. that kind of yeah. break without creating a menu. That was very <laughs> Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the next one was consider configuration changes that realize program quality improvements within optimal class sizes. <laughs> Can you yes. clarify Actually. that? Consider configuration changes. Do, uh, and the reason I ask is because looking at the timeline, we're looking at draft one 
um, really quickly. <laughs> and so it's like the configuration changes based on the model that was budgeted today, but not necessarily looking at any other models. Like, what does that mean? Are we waiting in, like? So I, I'm just, I, the only reason to have this here is that we are in this configuration conversations. Last year we presented the sixth graders, for example. So I, I think that we, you know, we, we want to be flexible in order to meet the threshold that, you know, you know in order to meet our, our yeah. What I want to say, our, in order to reduce our spending, I'm trying to be mm -hmm. diplomatic, right? Like, so we have, and not diplomatic, I'm just trying to be responsible, right? Like, as a board, we have the responsibility to lead, right? Mm -hmm. So we got to give tools to our administrators to be able to be responsible, come back to us, and maybe that is the lowest spending that we're asking for, right? Those three schools. So I'm just saying it is, it is broad, but it is... Uh, I think responsible to consider configuration I changes. I one hundred percent agree. The thing is, is we don't know what the configuration changes are. So to have that be a parameter that they're looking at going into the first draft seems seems like we are sure. also going to be making some decisions without having all of the information, right? Like all of, we do all of this in our best guess estimates. We do it all the time. So I I, I am trying to give them the trust to know our system and the conversations that we're being talking about to come back to us. Can, can I try to frame it yeah. that in a way that may be helpful is that it is this the are these other are these other configurations as we start to work as a leadership team looking at these to see are there other ways that we might be able given these suggestions that we could bring back as, as suggestions well, to the I guess board. that's my question because what keeps yeah. being presented are the only right. options being right. we either stay the same or we go to three elementary schools right I asked back right. September 3rd about presenting an option where we have four elementary schools because there's a very good chance that if it goes to a town vote, one, maybe two towns are going to vote not to close their schools. Sure. So I just, I feel like if we're going to be responsible, mm -hmm. we should be presenting information about, a, if not well, other option, at least a four elementary school option. Right. So that's why I'm asking when we're talking about configuration, are you only saying we're going to look at a three school elementary school model and what it would be if we stay the same, or are you looking at very realistic possibilities of other configurations for our district. And if not, I don't know that that should be a parameter. I, I think it's, it's so, the other fine line I'm trading is how much information can we get you, mm -hmm. right, in all of this, um, in the time frame, but also, I think it's it's the responsibility of the leadership team to, to look, are there other options, some that have been posed, that could help us move towards the the budget goals that we have. And I, I think that if I look at that, I would just say that, yes, we will look at some of those things. Try to flesh out, I mean, th I think it's to Patrick's point, trying to flesh out some of those boxes that are within that, um, within those other categories. I, I will assure you, there's no way that we can possibly do every one, and I think we all know that. I'm not asking but, for I'm asking for a very realistic yep. <laughs> I understand. parameter, which, because it is a very real chance we're going to have right. more than three elementary schools. I don't think any of us can sit here and say that we know for certain no, no town is going to agree to close their school. So I think, right. again, for us to be responsible, we should be looking at the very real possibility that we are going to be funding at least four elementary schools. And to not do that and not mm -hmm. have the leadership team thinking about that, I don't think is responsible. I hear you. So. Thank you. Oh, go ahead. Are you no. sure? I'm no. Danny Kendrick. Yeah. I'm going to get Daniel, Ursula, and okay. then Chris. I was just going to suggest a uh, change wording, mm -hmm. which uh, would be to consider, I, I acknowledge some limitations to this change wording, consider partial reconfiguration changes that realize program quality improvements and or cost savings within optimal class sizes. I think that that would include sixth grade, right? Yeah, it could include yeah. quite yeah. a lot of things. Right. Yeah. I think that's the intent is if if you know 
we're, we're all being presented with the reality that Natasha suggested that one or more towns might uh, refuse the desired reconfiguration of the administration that shouldn't necessarily be the end of the conversation, right? We should look elsewhere and get scrappy. And I don't think it's an exhaustive list, an exhaustive inventory of which of those configurations works, but, um, you know, just looking for opportunity. And I would just say, when I think about configuration, we considered it last year when we moved pre-K and K. That was a configuration change about so I, I don't think configure, when we're talking about it in this, we're just talking about closing schools. Yep. There are That's other why options. I asked for clarification because when we've been talking about configuration, we've been talking about the configuration around closing schools. Mm -hmm. So to now say that's not actually what we mean, no, and that's not what, and that's not what we're saying. That's, that's not what we're that's saying. That's why I asked for clarity. Yeah, that's not what we're that's saying. That's why my initial statement was, what do you mean by this? I want a clarification. Brissa? Melissa, or Michelle said what I was going to say. And, and to Natasha's point, the budget models are a three school and a five elementary school. So <laughs> we're not really talking about other configurations, uh, including the, the sixth grade moving up. That's, that's included in the budget models. But just for rough um, numbers purposes, with the midpoint between the five elementary and the three, be a workable number. Just for, for thinking about what the oh. budget might look like. Oh, I see what you're saying. The yeah. percentage somewhere yes. but somewhere at the midpoint between those in terms of yeah. budget, I, I, budgetary I, I, purposes. I really don't know. And I don't so I don't want to make any kind of promise around the particular, but I, I just don't know. Yeah. I think it's a fair question, but yeah. yeah. Julia, you had your hand well, up. I'm not sure if what I'm going to propose is helpful or not, but I was wondering if the intent of seven would be clear if we simply said yeah. consider configurations that real, realize program quality mm -hmm. improvements and so forth. Mm -hmm. Simply consider configurations that do these things. And so one configuration would be, mm -hmm. what if we maintain the status quo? One would be four elementary schools, one would be three. So I'm just going to say consider configurations that realize program quality. Yeah. Okay. I, I like that because that, that gives us, oh yeah, that's perfect. It gives us more options. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Long-term sustainability of our system is the last one. Mm -hmm. Can I make one more? Yes, go ahead. I'm almost afraid to say this sitting next to Susan. <laughs> <laughs> She's so nice. I am my friend. <laughs> I'm, I'm nervous about the budget coming back as the threshold being five schools and the minimum being three schools, or I might have that backwards. But I, I think we need to see ranges for both, mm -hmm. both yeah. so yeah. that we can actually understand what the cuts would be if we do end up with five schools or four schools or three schools. And I don't want to put, you know, I don't want you to have to give us six fully flushed out scenarios. So, but I just, yeah. I just caution that if you come if you come back with that and that's what's presented, then it still is the you're still not giving us choices necessarily. You're saying this is what configuration to three schools means and this is what five schools means. Yeah. I want a seven column page document this next meeting. Okay. That sounds okay. So uh, and then um, we're saying yes to long term sustainability of our system. Okay. Mm -hmm. I have a little okay. feedback I'm, about that one. Just in terms of like languaging it in a realistic yeah. way, because it just feels so hopeful to read. <laughs> but we can't, we can't deliver that because there's so many variables that are beyond. So just maybe adding for budget aspects that are within our control. Mm. Slightly redundant, but also just kind of reins it in when we're like thinking about. But are we upholding sustainability? No, we're not. We're not. Really, you know, with the. No, and, and I the think legislature, you know, with the long-term membership, yeah, and I, some things like that. But we can come back to what's within our control. Yeah, yeah and I, I, I totally agree with what is in our control. What I, what I question is that we have. Hopefully, everybody can hear me. But and actually, you're going to have to explain this because you explained it better the other way. To me. Uh, so if we're talking about long-term sustainability, and for I'm just going to give a weird example. For example, we refused two years ago to do some cuts 
that we were going to do. On, oh. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And then those cuts come back to us. And in two years, or, or in three years, okay. they are th double what would have been. So what I mean by sustainable, and what I'm trying to say by sustainable, yeah. and you can explain this better to me than I am doing. Well, actually, right Zach now. said exactly. it the right way, yeah. right? Which is that exactly. if we have a 10% increase yeah, year over true. year, we double our budget in 10 or in seven years. Seven, seven, seven years. years. Um, yeah. And so, so what happens for us is um, is whatever money that we don't cut now. Yeah. as a dollar is is more than a dollar that we have to cut in future years and so um so it just so that's what so, I expect. so i, I the, way, the way i explained it to floor and i think the the way that i would say to the to to everyone is that we are really not having a conversation here of of decreasing spending in terms of where we are now to, that we would be not spending as much money next year as we are now. We are talking about what is the appropriate level of increase that we can sustain within our communities. Um, and hopefully that increase is very low because it's just two sloped lines, right? The steeper the slope on that line, the, the more that we add to our budget each year, the, the more unsustainable that it is. And the lower the slope on that line, the closer to sustainable that we will be. I, our, we will not solve the problems of uh, school finance in this budget. And there are tax implications and things that are going to happen outside of us um, that we can't predict and we can't um, control. And so that's the, we just need to do the best we can to be as sustainable as possible, I think is the goal for, for us. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why I was you said it great. adding that language. So, what I, so I said, I, well, I added appropriate level of increase that we can sustain within our community. You should just clarify that it's financial sustainability we're talking about. Oh, correct. Not yeah, like long term. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's it's all it's all together. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. But you got Daniel and Chris. Daniel. Sorry, Laura. It's um, okay. Have, I'm just like. I have two other real. sort of budgetary points that I want to bring up, and I think one rises to the level of uh, a parameter for the budget, sure. which is transportation equity, and I think we need to look at addressing mm -hmm. the disparity between Worcester and the rest of the district in terms of bus, bus routes, regardless of configuration. Um, so prioritize transportation equity is probably what that would look like as a parameter. Um, and consider I wrote it. me proposing it. The other one is, and this is more important to me, with the configuration mod, the new configuration proposal, and I mentioned it at the configuration committee, and I don't think that was the first time either, but it's before and after care. And mm -hmm. understanding the costs of mm -hmm. implementing extended before and after care in the configuration model. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's why I wanted to include the table, because those were in there. Because there are several on that table that I would want to <laughs> pull out, especially in well-being. But I understand. Can I ask him a clarifying question? Yes. Daniel, when you say extended before and after care, do you mean beyond the current hours that are provided? Like? Yeah, I guess that's a good question. Opportunity. And Alicia asked a similar question about in terms of like what it looks like in terms of staffing and so on. And I, I just, I guess I would be interested in seeing a proposal of some sort from the administration for what that might look like and the cost on a per school basis. But I, I, I think smarter people than me would suggest something that would work well, but that would extend before and after care available to parents and families at those schools. So just to word, I'm not trying to wordsmith what you just said, but so opportunity for extended before and after <coughs> care, is that? Yeah. Okay. Equitable extended so that yeah. our, all our towns have access to before and after care? It, yeah, and that should go under the other the one. other equitable distribution of resources. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. It's Chris. Mm -hmm. Wait, hold on. It, Sorry. No, it's okay. Mm -hmm. I'm holding Mr. Chris for you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just under under five, five under the equitable distribution under of resources, equitable transportation. Equitable distribution of resources, equitable transportation or transportation equity meaning student need and access to the board. Okay. I just added it that. Oh, yes, I just messed up a little bit of the table, but I'll fix it in my glasses. Uh, Chris and then uh, Patrick. And then Diane also. So developing a mechanism where we are not adding 
new things without taking away things that are already present. Because talking about exploding your budget is you keep adding things and we keep, and we don't take things away. So I think having that, if we're going to add a program or add a, a something that could extend it care, where should that come from? Uh, what should we do less of? Um, because if we're, if we're not doing less of something, we're, <laughs> that's a, automatically a cost increase. Um, which may be, you know, that just contributes to lack of, uh, of sustainability, I think, over time. And, and which is, I mean, some things just aren't effective anymore, so we should be not doing them. Anyway. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, um, so I don't know if there's the right place to bring this up, and so if there's a better place, then let me know. But is there, uh, we have a conversation about, about bringing in money somehow. Bringing in money with grants, bringing in money with using our buildings and uh, more creatively in uh, in the summertime or something—is that is that something that can fit into our budget? Or I was just a chicken and I was not going to bring it up, so I <laughs> okay. I I didn't put it, it's but I had one opportunity to earn revenue. Yeah. yeah. So, for example, surrounding as you might want to send our kids to our therapeutic school. Or, or, or you know, I'm, I'm like sure. I'm opening a whole can of worms, so yeah. I, that's okay. why I added sure. this. Yeah, this, this, this uh, yeah. yeah. They no, want clarification on floor, I think. Floor, right? floor I just said so. Maybe um, having other kids come into some of Same. our programs from outside um, the district. Um, I, I would yeah, just. This is where I would just say I'm. I'm starting to feel a little overload on uh, yeah. on the requests of the leadership team, and I would just say that this would be an excellent thing for a small sub work group of a few board members and community members <coughs> to start exploring some of those things. Would right. be really. I. That's where I would push the initial piece, and yeah. and I know that that's asking of you already at 9:30. So, but I, I think that that would be a maybe a bridge too far for a leadership team in this current situation. I agree but with that. That's helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I, yeah. don't, I don't know if this is the wrong time to say this, but I, I know that we do have um, a lot of students from uh, um, other districts participating in like sports and like field. Like, so I'm not sure if that's what you're talking about, but um, working pretty good. Uh, <laughs> We got a girl from Hazen on my field hockey team, Montpelier, and Richard are two combined for lacrosse. We have girls from all around on the girls' hockey team and boys' hockey team, as well as the football team. Montpelier um, volleyball is also either like there's a lot of examples of like that happening, and I'm sure there could always be more, but that that is working. If you want to increase that uh, yep. finance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so we're not going to, I'm not going to put that in Diane, sorry. Yeah. So, and I feel compelled to say this since you brought up again, two years ago we made these decisions and I was one of those that made that decision. Please do not make assumptions as to what I know, what I don't know, and what I use to make my decisions. I'm very aware of what decisions are made and when and the consequences and the context of those. And I think as we move forward, having these discussions, we need to respect that each person is very aware, very professional, very engaged in the conversation. And we do think forward, we do think sideways, and I just, I feel compelled because the comment was made that two years ago we said we would do this and we didn't. And so, I just felt I needed to say that. Okay, we, I'm a little sensitive about time, so are we ready to approve the board parameters? I'm not comfortable without seeing them first, to be honest. Okay, I can share, my, if I share my yeah. screen, would that work? And I'm yes. gonna open the document here, uh, because I don't wanna wait until our next board meeting, because you guys need to get We're, we're meeting tomorrow. Time. Yeah, so hold on, oops, low battery. About to lose the meeting. I mean, if others are comfortable, I mean, then I mean, I no, like can see it. I mean, like to see. So, yeah, just hold on one minute. Yeah. You guys can oh, yeah. stand up and jump for a minute while oh, I yeah, get my inbox. Sorry. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have a quick break and try to get out of here before it Oh, I. Spencer, can you let me share? 
It says, I just sent your request. Or maybe it went to Stephen. I didn't get it. Okay. Can you make her? <laughs> okay, multiple presenters can share now. Okay, thank you. Try to make it bigger so that you guys can read and go to the second. It's okay. I'm getting there. Patience. Oh, okay. There we go. Okay. So. Yeah. Oh, I don't look at. I, I was taking notes also of other things you guys were saying. So, it, hold on a minute. Then let's just. So continue to offer and further develop the multi-layer system of supports to all students across all schools and professional development for teachers. I put in red what we talked about, strategic investment in building teacher capacity. Most Baltimore students will have what they need. Check? Yeah. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Concentrate the services we should include, tie the parts of our budget to service delivery to students. That's and tie. What? Just add the word and. And concentrate on the services. Yeah, what? concentrate on the services we should include and tie the parts. It's, just, it's minor, but it's, it's okay. I, I'm just, yeah, 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 I was just going You to, know my background. It's, it's okay. I'm like, yeah, frame. I can read it to you in Spanish, too, if you will. Like. Yeah. <laughs> frame, frame budget to the goals of our student, of our strategic plan. Wait, frame budget yep. to yep. the goals of our strategic plan and our, and our core, core beliefs. beliefs. Mm -hmm. Check. Yep. Yes. Yep. Okay. Number four is gone. Yep. I crossed it. So Let's put a verb on number five. On, you what? Let's add a verb to number five. Stay, stay remain. Under stay. Oh, oh, stay. Okay. Okay. Sorry. I just I didn't know that we had up. Stay under the yeah. excess spending threshold. <laughs> Continue to frame budget decisions around ed quality standards. Ed quality. What am I missing? Uh, there was a question around sorry. that. So that's the per pupil. That's the per pupil. Yeah, and the per pupil is actually going to be more important for us to keep an eye on because of the change, the possible change in long term um, average daily waiting. Okay. I, I just said that. Yeah, LTM ADW. Yeah, long term waiting. So, should we add that just so we remember of, of that amount per pupil? Well, that, that number is going to change. change. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, so I've just. So, so maybe eliminate the figures? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Okay, continue to frame budget decisions around ed quality standards, equitable distribution of resources, and meeting student. This is a little bit not totally cleaned up, as you can see, because I was typing as fast. Yeah, sure. So, meet student need transportation equity. I need to make those the same size. Opportunity for extended uh, before and after care. Yes. Okay. I, I'll clean it up, this, yeah, trust yeah, me. I'm yeah, not going to yeah, add yeah. any words there. I'm just going to clean it up. Yeah. Lowest increasing net spending with meeting EQS and addressing equitable distribution of resources, student needs. So enrollment and program reductions was what you offered. So I put it in their parentheses. Yeah, understood. It, is that OK? Can we put a verb at the beginning of that sentence, too? Increase. What would you like? Uh, commit to lowest increase, or I don't know what the word yeah. is. Provide the lowest increase? That's better. That's better. We strive for? No. No, no do provide, it. yeah. <laughs> Action. Just want to okay. point out that. No, I'm not going to do that. Yeah, you, you can't have it while yeah, we're at Just go for it. Would you I like to? <laughs> um, equitable distribution resources in both six and seven. Yes. We do because that's what you were. That's what you asked me for. So that's what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah. So I, I can do it. I had just one with equitable distribution resources, but so I can. Yeah. It's important. So sorry. Did you okay. want to say across schools? Is that what your thought was? It, it is a given, right? It's, it's for students. Student all student. all of our students. All our students. So provide. I'm going to move into eight. Oh, eight. eight. Consider configuration. It's, that realize program quality improvements within optimal class sizes. Mm -hmm. That's how you framed it. So 
long-term sustainability of our system. So I'm just saying appropriate level of increase that we can sustain within our community. In parentheses is what we talked about. I still think you should specify financial sustainability. Yeah, okay. Long-term financials. Yeah. yeah, we can do long-term financial stability. Yeah, I'm not going to address all the uh, environmental sustainability no, right now. No. Okay. I, I mean, we okay. take steps in our consider just to provide right, long-term financial. Okay. Achieve. Uh, achieve. 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 Oh, oh my gosh. Oh. Good luck with that. <laughs> Line. We can we all get our gold stars for good work. Got, gauntlet thrown down on that one. Jen, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, I'm seeing for Jen's thing. What, what word should we use, Jen? I'm like scaring Suzanne and Jen up to like. Consider. Try for. Try for. No, we just said we don't want to strike for things you want to do them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, then we're, we're, we're talking about it. I know. <laughs> oh, I move, to move towards long term sustainability. Yes. All right. Okay. We're, we're good. The tour. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. 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 All right. Okay, guys. So all. Suzanne Lux. No. 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 Do we have a motion? a motion to approve the budget parameters? Moved by Patrick. So second by. Everyone. By. Everyone. By Elizabeth. Yeah. And did you get that? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? We have budget parameters. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, board. I really appreciate that. OK. Now we're going to try to find my agenda. Bear with me. Um, policy work. Policy work. Plan cycle. OK. Can we have a motion to approve our policy work cycle? Plan cycle. I mean, we wait, what are we approving? The policy. 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 The work plan cycle. Um, can I ask a question? Oh, wait, wait, oh wait, wait. I know. I'm she sorry. She made a motion. I'm Chris made a motion. Second I'll by. Second. Oh, eight, you seconded. Eight. Okay. <laughs> I didn't hear. Second, second by Amelia. Okay. Um, discussion. First of um, I noticed the dates in the packet were from 2023, 2024, and had a lot of the things that we did did last year. Is there a we will be rotating everything up yeah. and okay. uh, and getting that done soon. Um, administration has been focused on other activities in the last uh, week. I have to find one pedantic thing to comment I on. I, I did that. To yes, you already got me. So it's. A, I didn't know I could so email ahead. Okay, we, all those in, unless there's other questions. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, the motion carries. And, and now we're going to move into. I have an agenda question that I didn't notice until now. Are we ever going to go back and look at the actual budget suggestion? We don't really have review. What? What do you mean? No. We weren't going to look at these at all? Those are for your information, but this is just. It's budget here. training. Yeah, this was really a part of the budget training, so you have that information. We'll, we'll, we'll get into the discussions. This was the, that baseline, right, that we've seen every year during budget training. Yeah. Right. It's uh, yeah, okay. just there's. So questions that I should email <coughs> with questions. Yeah, you can email yeah. us with questions, and I was also hoping that, that you were having that in mind as we were talking about our budget parameters. Yeah, so, yeah, there, there's okay. a, yeah, there's a lot to go for. Okay. Good? Okay. So uh, a firm policy work plan, we just did that. Uh, the next uh, point that we had was the firm and articles of agreement uh, for discussion that was brought up at our last, uh, at our last meeting. Yeah. So we consulted with our council. And what it's hard to hear you, open. Oh, the mic off. Uh, Did you push Can it? you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, I'm just trying to open the email right now. Oh, I made the wrong email. Sorry. You want me to say? Yes. All right. So, um, so one of the things that was um, that I asked is just to consult with our legal counsel. So I spoke with Scott Cameron, um, and uh, he he just emphasized a couple of things. The board can't bind um, a future board. Right, so so that can't be done, um, and a um, any the articles of agreement already are what you have to abide by, 
affirming them does not cannot change them in any way, shape, or form. All you're saying is uh, is a position statement. There's no policy that you can adopt that would change the articles of agreement. And so, um, yeah, the most that you can probably do is have a position statement about the articles. Um, but you are already bound to them, and they can't be. They can only be changed according to the process that's outlined in the articles of agreement. So the board doesn't have a say in that unless they go through the processes of the articles of agreement. But it's a, it, it's a political statement, is what it is. It's a community statement, um, and it's an affirmation of uh, the, right. that we're bound by the articles of agreement. And, and I would just remind the board, if a group of citizens came forward with a petition according to the articles of agreement, that would then start the process at that point in time. And you know, this is a good point for time for me to, um, in my last, our last meeting, um, I brought up the South Burlington case. Uh, which is Skip versus South Burlington about the name change. Uh, and the board had the discretion not to accept that petition and put it out for vote. But in reading the decision, um, the board's power is uh, limited because if it's a petition dealing with something that the community has to say in, then the board may have to put that petition out for a vote. Uh, and based on the articles of agreement, uh, since it is a district-wide vote, um, changing the articles agreement, a petition in that regard, I think, would have to, and the board would have to deal with it, and wouldn't be able to not deal with it. Um, and that's my opinion, having read that decision, and it's, um, you know, it's, it's not as absolute discretion as I thought. Right, and that's the concern that I had, yeah. and why I thought seeking legal counsel's advice was correct on that. And yeah. so I, we would, I would agree with what legal counsel told me and what you just said. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, are we at a break point? Uh, Julia. Just a break in terms. Do we have to we finish have, we this? Have some, we just have yeah. to finish yeah. this, yeah. and we have a question, Julia. I don't have a question. I have a comment. The request made by a number of Worcester residents, as I'm remembering it was not for us to, re to request for us to reaffirm our commitment to the Articles of Agreement to which we know we are bound, but to promise to honor and abide by the decision of any particular town to vote not to close their school. And we talked a lot at last week's meet, well, the previous meeting about a feeling of um, how important it is to feel that our communities trust us and that there's a feeling of um, mistrust at the moment. And I think to say that we promise to abide by and honor a town's decision not to close their school is an important thing for us as a board to do. I feel really, really strongly about that, and I've heard that from a number of, um, a number of folks. So I, I think the only thing that we can do tonight, Julia, is really to, as a board, that I, you know, like we all affirm that we're bound by our articles of agreement and that we can only change those articles of agreement according to the process outlined in the but, articles of agreement. That's not what I'm suggesting, and that's not what other people have suggested. I, it's I different. Just, could we not, as a board, affirm our commitment to honor and not attempt to override any town vote regarding closure of its own school? That's apart from our yeah, articles of agreement. It's separate. It, it, we can certainly affirm that, but yeah. it's not, it doesn't bind exactly. a future board. Exactly. Of course not. But well, we can certainly affirm that and so make, a, make a move for a resolution. Yeah, and I, and I think what I worry about is that we, we, we're not just losing trust with one community, we're losing trust with all of our communities, right? So we're looking at this as a whole, right? Our responsibility is to the towns as a whole, I understand. not just to the people that come to the board, right? right? That have the time to come to the board and to be here. Because we have plenty of people that have ex expressed concerns, and we and we have a budget to pass. We have so so our responsibility is to all our communities, right? So by abiding by our articles of agreement, we're not making. I don't want to make false promises to our community members. I want to make true promises that we're going to abide by the articles of agreement, right? But what about if the numbers came differently to us and we had to make decisions, right? But you're saying it's not legally binding, so in this moment... What do we have to lose? It's a, it's a statement in good faith that we will honor and... We will and honor our articles not of attempt, agreement. That's not what I'm saying. I think that's you can weird. make your motion. Would you, would you like to make a motion, Julia? 
Can I make a motion that we vote on something? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You would make a motion for this us, for like, action. can I give an example? Yeah. Like, yeah. you would make a motion, like, I move that we make your statement. Right, like affirm. Yeah. Thank you. I didn't have that word in my brain. Do it, do it. Right, and then and then somebody seconds it, and then we have discussion, and then we vote on it. That's what happens with motions. All right. I would like to move that we affirm to make a commitment to honor and not attempt to override any of the district town votes regarding the closure of the town school. I second it. Okay, discussion. We have a motion. Did you get that, Lisa? Can you repeat it? Discussion. Can I just clarify? I'm happy to actually affirm that. I just want to clarify we can't override the town's vote, correct? No. no. There are no. many ways you could override the town's vote. Okay. True. You as a board yeah. could okay. put this. You don't need a petition. I looked at the article. So, yeah. Okay. You don't need a petition to do this. We're asking not to put it to a district level. We are also asking that you not do what you have discussed in the legislature of trying to go to the governor. To override the there, there are two potential ways that you could just have to override. So we're asking you to not do that. Did, yeah, describe you, you, the first one again. I just didn't hear. But we, we are not in a back and forth. We are right. not in yeah, public comment. I just want to. We are not question. in a public comment. I, I need to be able to hear it. But we're not in public comment right now, are we? What? Well, but we just, we're engaging a community member. Right. But if he's asking a question about the motion that was made, and he had an explanation, and I didn't hear it, I shouldn't be deprived of hearing what he said the first part. When I was breaking the rules the first time, <laughs> what I said was that. One of the ways, so there's nothing in the Articles of Agreement that speaks to a petition. There's no language about a petition in the Articles of Agreement, which means that the board itself could decide, if you don't like the Worcester vote, that you could say, as a board, we are going to put to, we're going we're gonna to move, we're going to make a motion to change the Articles of Agreement by putting it to a district-wide vote. Yep. And we are asking you not to do that. Well, yeah, well, I was just, just asking that we affirm to Honor and not attempt to override a time. You don't need a petition to do that. That's, that's all. Okay. Yeah. And, and I, what I want to cautious us is that we are bound to the process. When we did the Articles of Agreement, it was not us that made the decision. It's, well, it's doing the same. Wait, wait. It's doing the same thing to our voters that you're asking us not to do. We're, we're telling our voter, we're, even though it's not binding because we can't really do anything about it, we're making a decision without putting this to vote to our community, which understands that the only way to change our Articles of Agreement is by the process outlined in the Articles of Agreement. We're saying that we're not going to follow that process now without giving them a chance to tell us how they feel about that. We're not just voting on Worcester. We're voting on Callas. We're voting on East Montpelier. We're voting on Doty. We're voting on all of our communities. I object to the implication, that you, that suggestion, that we're only speaking on behalf of Worcester. I'll Unless speak on behalf true. of Berlin. Sorry, go ahead, Mark. Well, I was just going to say, um, and I know what Noah said about a petition, but if our towns people, because we are five towns, can bring a petition forward for us to open up the Articles of Agreement, right? That is that is what that's what Chris was talking about. It's not the board who, who I mean, the board can say, yep, we're not going to open up the Articles of Agreement, but if the towns get together a petition to open them up, then that is a, a whole different story where. I believe we have to put it up to a vote. Then. It's already been suggested in the letter to the board. Yeah, right. so as a, as a Berlin rep, the, our articles of agreement are very important because it is right now, it's a question for potentially Callis and Doty. That does, we're a merged district. At any point, any of us could be having this conversation. So to me, I absolutely affirm that in my role, I understand that I am not looking to change whatever votes occur. All new information comes, all new considerations come, we will address them as they come. But for tonight, and as we move into this work, I am fully committed to those articles of agreement and have no intention of changing what had come before. But that's not what the motion says, Diane. Right, that that's is not, not what we were the motion says. Yes, it is. It's, it's saying not what the motion that says. I, I'm not, so I am affirming 
that I believe in these articles of agreement, and I have, I, regardless of if um, three towns vote to not close, I am going to respect what those towns have said, and I think that we agreed to that in those articles of agreement, and now, and if you don't have articles of agreement that you use in these tough times when the question comes up, then what's the point of an article of agreement? We were trying to look forward to say, okay, in the heat of the moment, this is our guiding light. And so I am saying that I affirm that, and I have no intention, but business changes, and then as it comes up, and I, and then I'll take the information and respond in that information. But in this moment, I have no intention of rethinking for each town. Can you go ahead, Zach? I think we need to remember that there are a lot of people who have not been showing up to these a lot of these meetings who, in private conversations, are telling at least me that they feel incredibly disenfranchised by this process. And I don't think we should be taking a vote here tonight without having given those people an opportunity to speak. I think it's a real, I would need to hear a real solid theory of democracy that says why is it okay in a regional government to allow a very small portion to make major decisions for the, for the whole. And I haven't heard that. Our article Daniel, wait, 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 wait. Daniel? I was just gonna say, I don't think, I don't see a vote of affirmation uh, running counter to what you just said, Zach. And I'm, I'm, I agree with Diane. I'm, I'm similarly prepared to affirm this and also feel as if I'm not, that vote in no way disenfranchises the will of voters who are inclined to to petition for for a different action at a different later time. And I also call the vote. On the motion on the yes. can you read I, the motion again? Yeah. Um McCalen moved to affirm to make a commitment to honor and not attempt to override any WC S D Towns vote regarding the closure of its own Okay, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Can we, can we have the vote on his call, motion to call the vote? We have to vote. Motion. Do what? No, no, we need to vote. Vote. no if, you, if you call the motion, you well, can call, have my... If you, if you, you call the motion... I mean, did everybody get a chance to speak? Yeah. Well, I should be on the back. Let's consult the network. Yeah, it's right here. No, I, you know, I guess I just want to make a comment about uh, Zach's comment about a regional government. We have a national government. No, you you don't no, get to no, speak right done. now. You, don't you get have to not been. Right. You don't get to speak right now. What? You just just wait. You a have minute. to be acknowledged by just, the chair. Yeah, that is just, literally just Robert Schultz. Just wait a minute, and Patrick had his hand up before. So let's just question. result this question for a minute that you that brought yourself yeah. up. So just hold a minute. It doesn't say about calling a question. Sorry, my quick guide didn't have that one. It's too quick. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sir, go ahead. Can I tell you what it typically is? Would that be helpful? Typically, you vote on a call, and if the vote goes down, then you can open it back up for discussion. So we would need a second. Yeah, you need a second. I'll second the call. Okay. Mm -hmm. All those in favor of calling the question, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Nay. I don't think everybody had been heard. So there's two opposed, and everybody was an aye. So the ayes have it. So the motion is, I'm, I'm sorry, but that's just. That's fine. Yeah. It's democracy at work. Yeah. So the. Please, Lisa, could you read the motion again? Yeah. To affirm to make a... <laughs> 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 to affirm to make a 
This is my moment. Gotcha. <laughs> Go for it. To affirm to make a commitment to honor and not attempt to override any WCUUSD town's vote regarding the closure of its own school. Okay, all those in favor, please signify by raising your hand because I think it might be easier. Nine, ten. Did I write? Did that right? So yes. And uh, any opposed? Please raise your hand. One, two, three, four. Okay. And any abstentions? Seeing none, the ayes have it. The motion has carried. Okay. Let's move now into I, I, our I, central. I a, we in our previous meeting, uh, we asked um, Stephen to look into. Uh, cost of the of the Dodi bus route. If we were to add a Dodi bus route, we have to add factual information. We are still working on that because it can. can yeah. um, uh, uh, Chris, Paul. can we just stay on the agenda right now, and then we'll move into future agenda yes. items? So just let's just stay on task right now because we have right, still. So Central Vermont Career Center, there was a report. Um, in, sorry, no <laughs> reports for the board. We, have we still need to do four point seven. So the appointment to the VSBA proxy for the annual meeting uh, could I have a motion? It typically has been Ursula has been our proxy to vote. It, this year it's going to be remote. Uh, could I have a motion to point? For our new members, do they need to maybe know what's going on? Yeah, so for our new members, uh, so I'm not tired. We need okay. a little bit of a break. So no. uh, for our new members, the VSBA, is the Vermont School Board Association, has its annual meeting. At the annual meeting, we vote in the resolutions brought over to the uh, association from all of our members across the state. At the annual meeting, we vote on the new resolutions, and then we also vote in the resolutions as a whole, the continuing resolutions that we kept from the year before, or any resolutions that we have as that are permanently and in our books. Changes. And, and bylaws, and we have a very few bylaws changes this year. This meeting, for the first time, we're going to hold it online in the in the hopes to get more attendance into our conference this year. The conference is going to start on on a Thursday afternoon and just go for the whole day on Friday, as opposed to having people having to take two full days. We will have a celebration, and you guys hopefully got the newsletter and read your president's letter. Uh, so uh, that's that's what it is. We're gonna do this uh, this meeting on online, and we as a district we have one vote on that, and we have usually uh, anybody can come to the conference, and hopefully that more people come to conference this year. At the annual meeting, uh, we need somebody to vote on our behalf. We will be reviewing the resolutions at our next meeting before the uh, October seventeenth is when the meeting is. Any questions? Okay. So could I have a motion to appoint? Motion to appoint Ursula to be our VSBA proxy for the annual meeting. Thank you. Second. That's, so moved by Michelle, second by Zach. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, the motion carries. Uh, I had scheduled a 10 minute because I was thinking that we would go a little faster, but considering the time, let's just have a five minute break. At least I need to stand up for two minutes because it's almost 10 o'clock. Okay? And we're going to lose you. Okay. I knew you would love it. I miss you. I asked for them. So, okay. Okay, board, let's get going because at least I have a lot of work to do tonight still, and I would like to get home. So, good night. Thank you for coming back. Bye. Thank you. Okay. So we're going to cruise through the superintendent and central leadership team call report. It, there was a comment that was sent to us, hopefully everybody can hear me, it, about not highlighting enough our elementary schools. We were hoping to have some of our principals highlight our... It. So we're, we're going to start visiting our elementary schools so that we, we can rotate to there. We were going, what we were going to try to do is also highlight, and we will in the future, one of our elementary schools that we wouldn't be visiting for a while, just to have that principal highlight some stuff. They're in bed now, yeah. um, so because uh, they have to get up and work in the morning, so I so just still see them there. But considering the time, yeah, we're I will we're, we're moving. That. Yeah, oh, thank you. Wait, this was no. for. Oh, I'm muted. That's for the suit, the oh, cold yes, report. For the principal's report. Principal's report. Okay. And 
So Could we're I? gonna go quickly through that, but we're gonna stay first on the superintendent and the superintendent report, he was gonna highlight a one specific part that relates to the Career Center. Yes, okay, so um, I did need to highlight something from the Career Center. You may have seen an article in the newspaper that said, hey, U32 is a potential site. Um, I just wanna be very clear. Um, so I'm reading their release so that we understand this. So the Central Vermont Career Center uh, school district has been working towards a vision of a state-of-the-art facility that serves all eligible students in our region. This will include an expanded capacity for increased enrollment, increased academic achievement through full-day programming, pathways to advanced career credentials, and strengthening partnerships with middle schools across the region to improve student access and eliminate barriers to participation. So they, this Career Center, are in the exploratory phase of their work and have completed visioning and programming and begun our site selection process. This involves reviewing all potential sites, contacting landowners, site analysis and preliminary site, and building layouts for cost estimation purposes. In the future, we will finalize a site, develop the site and, and building plans, estimate the cost of the project, and begin community outreach, which will culminate in a bond vote. U32's site is one of a few sites that's being considered, and for some of the sites, test fit diagrams have been developed to deepen their understanding of the potential location. These drawings are preliminary in nature and are intended to explore how a building of this size might fit on the site. Further investigation of site restrictions and building design is required before any final confirmation. They have not come to us with any requests to actually locate the Career Center here, but they have looked at our site as one of the potential places because we offer, we already have some of the things that were part of their requirements. They also have other sites that they're looking at. We are definitely a popular potential location, but there are a lot of considerations that we will have to address before we move forward in anything else. They haven't asked us. Nothing we, is final. And nothing like is final. Yeah, so there's plenty of sites. So I was at the most recent board meeting and this came up and um, I asked for in, uh, what they would like. You know, they, they stopped short of formally asking me to ask to bring that up at this meeting to ask anybody formally about asking us formally, right? So, right. So they're they're in they're in the looking at drawings uh, stage, and 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 this this campus was is like you said, well, some a place that they're considering asking to look at. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so that is why we wanted to highlight in the superintendent report and then we were going to move into the principal's report and I, I, I always feel like we kind of shortchange and I see a lot of our principals still online so do you want to see if they still want to comment? So, so actually Celia um, said she is still up and that she, we were going to ask her to highlight Berlin because we won't be at Berlin for a while on our yeah. visits and so we we're going to try to get like the furthest out on our visits and so we're going to ask her and then we'll be at Callis in uh, one of the next board meetings. Celia, welcome. Celia. Can you make your speaker there, uh, yep. Spencer? So we yep, can. she will. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> okay, great. Y'all, I'm usually asleep by about 8.30, so don't hold me in anything I say. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so uh, one of the things that I wanted to highlight um, in our report is the, um, is our, initiative with well-being and inclusivity. So um, we sent a team to BEST, the BEST Institute, at the end of June. And um, with the addition of Tyler Smith as our behavior systems coordinator, we've really um, Im improved our school-wide behavior systems. And we've rolled those out to staff and sort of recommitted to um, just recommitted to a lot of the practices that were in place pre-COVID um, and, and are infusing more of um, just uh, acknowledging that um, students, students need to be recognized for positive behaviors and we need to be really clear and explicit about what we're asking of them. Um, so we are noticing all of those and really committing to building um, inclusive and connected learning communities. So um, really we're starting with joy. We're starting with looking at our transitions and we've got adults that are all over the building and giving high fives and checking in with kids. And um, it's really fun meeting kids off the bus is one of my, like the highlights, hands down highlights of my day. Um, so that's, 
I welcome any of you to stop by and hang out in our building. Um, we, uh, we're, we're trying to um, just notice the positive and the joy that's happening in our building. So um, that's where we're starting with our best team. We're recognizing the good in all of the things that our students are doing. Um, so moving forward this year, we're going to um, continue to have different focuses. And um, we're also going to continue our work with Joelle Van Lent, who is actually in our building today. Um, so we're really looking forward to um, just an increased focus on that well-being for our community. Thank you, Celia. Are you? Yeah, thank you for being up so late and staying with us, and thank you for all you do. So with, with that, if, if Stephen, I wonder if you want to just do a quick highlight of the, the, how we changed the report from the principals oh. so that... Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I'll make it quick. You, you can probably okay. see that the principal's report is trying to align a little bit more with our strategic plan mm -hmm. and the goals of our strategic plan. And so we, we just changed a little bit of the headers and are going to try to focus on that so that you can see the work that we're doing to meet those goals. Thank you. Uh, Central Vermont Carrier Center, Patrick. Yeah, so I um, wanted to bring up that building thing, but uh, so that's, that's good. Saw your know. thunder. That's fine. It's a better for your view, I think. <laughs> Um, uh, another thing to report from that meeting is that the, um, the Career Center has just opened a new um, welding classroom, which nice. is awesome. It's got, I, I can't remember the exact number, but it's like 15 bays nice. with, with uh, TIG welding and, and um, all different kinds of, of welding and plasma cutters. They have these yeah. giant uh, air handlers to take care of the, the nasty smells, and it was a really impressive tour that we got at the last uh, board meeting. So they're they're really um, really doing some 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 excellent things over there at Spalding. And the reason for having the discussion about uh, new building sites is because they got um, over 400 applicants last year for just over 200 spots, and so they're looking to make more space for, for more of the kids that that are interested in the services they provide. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot of our kids in that welding program from U32. That's great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, the SBA update, I feel like I just kind of gave you an update. I'm going to skip the uh, uh, You have a question? Um, a comment. I'm wondering, is there a way during the student report that we could get feedback from the elementary school students and the middle school, middle school students? Mm -hmm. I know that there's, yeah. you know, student councils and leadership in those buildings, and I would love to hear about things other than just the high school kids. Yeah, and Linnea is working on that. They were working okay. on it. Great. I even made a note to maybe take um, one of the student reps when I go to visit some of the schools so yeah. that, you know. Great. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now let's, uh, like I said, the SBA, just please read that newsletter. There's a lot of information in that little packet, uh, that, that little newsletter that you received at home. Just please, please read it. Um, Finance Committee meeting. Uh, could we have a motion to approve a multi year capital improvement project budget? Go ahead. I move that the board authorize the allocation of $267,174. Oh, did you want the other one? No. Nope. $174,000. i am going to start over. I am very sorry. Yeah, it is okay, late. I'm like, okay. Go ahead. It's late. It's it late. is late. Okay. I move that the board authorize the allocation of $267,174 additional capital reserve funds to the completion of the projects as identified above and approve the district moving forward with the <coughs> bid document and bidding as necessary. Thank you. Uh, second? Second. Thank you, Daniel. Any discussion? Any questions? That was the recommendation of Finance Committee, too. Yeah. So yeah. if we vote yes, does that can? Uh, Definitely allocate that money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. It means we'll start with the bid Yeah. Right now. And we're staying on schedule with what we have in our five-year plan. So, any other? Oh, those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none. The motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and then the next one. I'll do it. You. Yeah. Uh, Daniel. Daniel. So Ursula move and Daniel. There's one more motion there, uh, Ursula. Oh. I move that the board approve the amount 
to budget in the general fund to transfer to the capital reserve fund in fiscal year 2025-2026 as $1,047,964. Second. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you, Ursula. So, Ursula moves it. Danielle seconds it. Any discussion? Yes. Now, if we vote yes, is that a budget item that is then set in stone? No, I mean, it's always changeable by the board. It's always changeable. But not, but not into the capital plan, though. Um, that's just so that I know what to keep in the budget as yeah. you present your draft one. As you a, all can, as a board, make that make a change in the future, yeah. Okay, so that's not yeah. allocated to a project yet? Nope, no, okay. just the 267-174 will go towards those projects listed there, and we'll start the bid documents and bidding, so that kind of locks us in to working on those yeah. projects. Okay, so... But this is just knowing, it lets me know what number to put in the draft one budget. Can I just raise it because of our budget mm -hmm. issues? No. Coming that's up. fair okay. question. Thank yeah. you. You're not binding a future board. Right. As okay. much as we'd like to. Yeah. Okay, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. Okay. Have to go all the way back to the first page of the agenda. So, yeah. We're going to have the policy committee with permission of the policy committee chair with consultation of policy committee members. Uh, we're going to. Yeah, yeah, table, table the reading of that first because they will have more information on the next meeting because they're in the top. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like us to move into approving personnel. So if somebody can move into that page 43 and approve the new teachers. Go ahead, Diane. I move that we accept the change in FTE for Christina Snook and point two for library media specialists. Technology Integrationist at Rumney, and that we uh, hire Mackenzie Wardell at point eight FTE long term sub in the pre class pre K classroom at East Montgomery. Second. Thank you. Diane, thank you, Natasha. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstention? The motion carries. In the next one. Consent agenda. Mm -hmm. Approve minutes from nine. Can I have a motion to approve the minutes? I move to approve minutes. Thank you, Patrick. A second. Second, a second by Chris. Any amendments to the meetings? To the meetings. To the minutes. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. Uh, approve board orders. Where's the full? Oh, good job. Somebody gave it to me. Okay. I move that we approve the board orders in a total amount of one million two hundred ninety-five thousand five hundred fifty dollars and ninety-three cents. Second. Okay, moved by Ursula, second by SAC. Any questions? Hearing none. One million two hundred ninety-five thousand five hundred fifty ninety-three cents. All right. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The motion carries. Uh, future agenda items, we have a board resolution discussion where we were just talking. We will go over the resolutions that were just five, and so that Ursula knows what's the pleasure of the board for, for the vote. Um, and uh, and no, then, oh, oh, yeah, and then that one, that actually, that one, it was the, the resolution that Chris brought right. up. It's that we we're going to bring it up at a future board meeting. It's just, we're a little busy. Next one. Maybe. <laughs> Depending on how we build the agenda, but we will, you know. Okay. The, what was that again? Yeah, it's just the, a board resolution for to send to the legislature. Yeah. The second one she added was the VSBA resolutions and yes. bylaw changes. Okay, now we can move into board mm -hmm. reflection and then you can reflect no, no. and say no, what agenda, you want. future agenda is the Dodi question. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, okay, now board reflection at 10 15 p.m. I'm sorry, we had a long meeting today, but there was just no other way. Well, my question is that I thought it was a uh, somewhat provocative but good meeting in terms of having direct uh, and very specific conversations on a, a lot of topics. I thought it was good. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. 
Okay. Any other reflections? All right. Okay, seeing none, uh, we can open up for public comment. Channing. She need a microphone. Do you want the microphone, Chen? Hang on, Alan. Thanks for letting these people last time. I wanted to just read from, we turned to slide 17 of the budget training slide deck, which was showing different for people and the cost and what um, was shown as a kind of thing we on Monday. That's different. On what um, I gather is the correct student numbers. The two other projectors for students at Derby and FY26, which is a decrease of 13 students from FY25. And the explanation was that Derby is graduating at classes 13 6th graders this year, which I think is true. Um, so I was confused about whether this number represents all Worcester kids, regardless of the building in which they're being educated, or only the kids in the building. But either way, the 61 students seems to be missing incoming students. So if it's the Worcester, if it's all Worcester kids, it's supposed to be missing income <coughs> pre-K students. And if it's um, only the kids who are being educated in the building, then it's missing income from the Harvard students. And either way, like a small number of students who are missing from that number makes a big difference in the per pupil spending. So even if you add just five or six students, the per pupil spending comes down into the $28,000 range. And, it may seem like I'm nitpicking here, but the reason this is so important to me is that the communications that are coming from the board and the superintendent, um, intentionally or not, have communicated, <clears throat> have convinced a lot of people in our five-town community that they can blame Doty and Callis for unwanted taxes. And this is, I, I believe this is true, this is how I perceive these communications. And I, I have a lot of empathy. Like I understand how it's hard to get these numbers, but I totally get that part. But um, given the scapegoating of Doty that's already happening, I, I just would ask for you to be really careful with these numbers because anything that's inaccurate that contributes to this idea that it's too expensive to run Doty, I think just drives wedges um, that don't help us. So thank you. Thank you so much for hearing me. Thank you, Jenny. Yeah, go ahead. Oh. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, I just, and I don't um, plan pre-written this, but I I have a question. Do you mind introducing yourself for the people oh, that I'm don't sorry. know? Yeah, yeah. yeah thank you. Um, yeah, from Western. Um, and I'm just wondering if the current low number of kindergarten and, and especially pre-K kids um, may well be tied to parents who are thinking, I have no idea what's happening with this school, and and I, so I'm going to find an alternative um, mm -hmm. and look, or keep my kid at home this year, which I think is happening for some parents. So I'm not sure that the, that the projected number, whatever it might be, for the K, pre-K that we're going to get um, is, is um, correct. Um, and, and I also think that offering a full day program would make a huge difference for a lot of parents out in the school. So, thanks. Thank you. Okay, I don't I see anybody else. That that I don't see anybody eight, else in the, on the pre-K. Is the estimate from by the records? Okay. I don't see anybody else in the public, but we have one. Uh, uh, Mr. Gilbert, do you want to introduce yourself and speak? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I did write some comment earlier I was going to read, but I'd be crazy to to uh, make you listen to it now. <laughs> I would like to say, however, that, that the disparities in per-pupil spending among the town's five elementary schools is something that really needs to be more closely reviewed before plans are moved forward. You know, at, at Monday Finance Committee, we were told there was a discrepancy of $8,000 between per pupil spending at Doty versus East Montpelier. Two days later, that number had been revised down to a $2,000 difference. And we had repeatedly asked to have per pupil cost figures, but to no avail. And then until two years ago, until two days ago, that's when we finally saw them. And then to have the figures revised with only a couple of weeks before a decision is to be made on school closures, 
I'm sure you can understand why this is felt a bit, well, just a little bit odd. Differences among per pupil costs across schools has been a disparity crying for explanation. Lack of explanation weakens trust among the district's towns. So thank you. Thank you. I don't see any other hands up. I want to thank everybody for their extra commitment tonight and you know, you're getting back to your families late. And I want to thank the public for being here and being part of this mm -hmm. conversation. And, and there's no other way forward but through it. So we'll see you at our next, at our next meeting and we'll do our best to answer any questions and we'll be putting an update out as soon as possible. Thank you. I move that we adjourn. Oh, thank Second. you. Second. Second. Since everybody's leaving. Aye. 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 Aye.